Well, yeah, but that was that was regarding the activist legal defense funds uh, scam specifically. And yes, that was part of the that was the major uh, thrust behind the CO, COS CLC's uh, investigation of of Luke Krudowski was was looking through the bank records that had been leaked and discovering all sorts of malfeasance and embezzlement that I was mentioning earlier and so forth. Uh, but yeah, there there were more cases they did that weren't just about legal defense funds. There was other stuff. Uh, some things in one particular case mentioned briefly in passing here that kind of mimics something like a Randy Weaver type situation that could have gone exactly like Randy Weaver if if uh, if things had uh, if they if certain events happened uh, thankfully a different way where where Ruby Ridge situation was thankfully avoided. But yeah, there's been some close calls and some other very fun things. Again, topic for another time to go into more detail. But uh, yes, um, let me put it this way. Informant hunting and, of course, ostracism of such informants is uh, a rather important, genuinely activist, if you're going to use that word, a genuinely activist type uh, activity that I wish people would do uh, more often. But then again, if they're not going to be skeptical... And if they're going to go wallow in doom porn, of course they're going to not, you know, engage in informant hunting and, and providing judicial transparency and so forth. And welcome to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. Today I've got another re-release for you. Uh, one of the most important episodes we did over at Liberty Under Attack Radio uh, during our direct action series, originally recorded July 7th, 2016. It also happened to be our longest ever, totaling 3 hours and 15 minutes live. Uh, so yes, you know this is a re-release with my long-lost co-host, uh, Kyle Reardon. Um, <laughs> yeah, the topic is security culture. Uh, in essence, this was our attempt to condense his, at that time, only anthology, uh, down into one radio broadcast, uh, hence the sheer length. Uh, of course, now this anthology, just below the surface, A Guide to Security Culture, can be found in paperback format via Liberty Under Attack Publications. That link is libertyunderattack.com forward slash, uh, forward slash JBTS. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash JBTS. And the link to purchase on Amazon is there, uh, and uh, you can find it on Kindle uh, if that's uh, your preference. You can also um, just search Liberty Under Attack, uh, just search uh, the Liberty, Liberty Under Attack website, uh, and you can find the, P the uh, PDF as well. Uh, I suppose I should provide a few notes before turning over to this lengthy discussion since, as I said, it was uh, originally recorded July 7th, 2016, so over four years ago. First off, the discussion on dragnet wiretapping, cell phone privacy, and surveillance is certainly moot now uh, with the track and, contract, uh, con uh, track and contact trace technocracy nonsense. Um, overt, uh, overt surveillance has moved to the legal and lawful realm, so yeah, that's totally irrelevant now. Um, in, in my humble opinion. This episode reminded me again that I need to put, uh, put together some content specifically on dual-layer encryption, even if it's just exerting that one article out of uh, just below the surface and posting it on the TVP website. Um, he'll talk about it in a half hour or so, but uh, this is the way we communicate securely on the First Realm Internet. Uh, more on this later. Uh, number three, about 43 minutes in, I talk about how difficult it would be uh, living without slave tags like social, secu uh, social security cards, driver's license, uh, etc. Well, four years later, and my opinion has changed a bit on that. Self-sufficiency plus the use of proxy merchants plus agorism uh, when necessary uh, is a pretty solid combination, and I would say in a good location as well. Um, you know, if you're if uh, you're doing rural homesteading and working towards self-sufficiency, and you only need a couple few things a week or a couple few things a month from the grocery store or something, uh, then you can you can probably set that up without. Um, you, can, you can probably, I mean, yeah, yeah, you can probably make it happen. But anyway, yeah, just figured I'd, I'd toss that, that comment in there uh, and more on that in, in the future as well. And uh, the last point for now, I think, is uh, I forgot how much of a servile society hell I was, ba I was in back in uh, 2016. Um, all the higher-level indoctrination um, plus the shit servile society, em society employment. And not even the employment itself, but I was struggling just to find part-time employment back then. Um, and this is 2016, so... Yeah, anyway, um, I'm definitely thankful to have uh, have made it to this point, uh, living this liberated lifestyle here at the Free Republic of Pasnia, pasnia.com. Got those first realm ties, my friends. I mean, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's quite incredible. Um, it's quite incredible. They can't, uh, they can't stop you from, from leaving. Uh, they can't stop you from leaving. 
So um, I think that's uh, all I have for this uh, brief introduction to uh, the 99th episode of this podcast. Uh, of course, you can find all the show notes. You can find links to purchase uh, just below the surface of Guide to Security Culture um, there uh, at the uh, yeah at uh, uh, in the show notes vonniepodcast dot com forward slash ninety nine, or you can just go directly to the webs to the LUA website libertyintact dot com forward slash jbts. I will also mention just. Uh, here in uh, the last uh, couple notes that uh, I updated uh, the self-liberation bundle on the LUA Publications website. So that now has uh, 18 books, I think it is. I think 18 books. Uh, so the price jumped up a little bit, but uh, I have published in, like four or five books in the past two or three months. And there will be another uh, probably one or two before uh, before the holidays. So lots of uh, stuff coming out uh, via LUA Publications. Um, in terms of uh, the Free Republic of Pasnia, we're just, uh, you know, I guess hungering down for a very mild winter. Um, as they uh, tend to be here in Southern Illinois, uh, I, I certainly like uh, like I certainly appreciate that. But uh, yeah, that's uh, that's going to be what what'll what'll be happening, I, I guess, uh, in the next uh, I guess midterm. Uh, short term, got some uh, self liberators coming out to the homestead. Uh, to, we're going to be having a, a very Pasnia Thanksgiving. Uh, uh, here going to have you yeah, a handful of folks. Uh, so um, that'll be a, a lot of fun. Um, it'll be it'll be yeah it'll be fantastic. It re- reminds me of. Um, we did the uh, what? What holiday was it? I think it was Thanksgiving, actually. Um, when uh, was it Thanksgiving? Yeah, it was. It was. Yeah, when I was in Acapulco, uh, we had uh, that anarchist Thanksgiving at John and Lily's house, um, and that was the first, I guess, I guess the first uh, liberated holiday, so to speak, I've ever really uh, experienced outside of, uh, I guess, the holiday weekends down here um, in Southern Illinois, riding and camping. Uh, when I would do that, you know, on weekends, but yeah, it's definitely a di- definitely a different experience and. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I'm, I'm I'm looking forward to it. And again, as I mentioned in the last episode, if you happen to, uh, I, I think this episode episode is going to go out um, by Wednesday. It'll go out on Wednesday, so it's it's probably going to be too late. But you know, if you're in the in the area, obviously, in the and if you're near Pasnia, the USSA called Southern Illinois, um, please do. Um, you know, uh, love to have people, uh, love to have tourists stop by, uh, stop by the Free Republic of Pasnia. So. Uh, to find out more information, just visit Paznia.com. And uh, yes, for this podcast, uh, again, show notes for this one, vanupodcast.com forward slash 99. If you're brand new to Vanu, I would highly recommend, uh, yeah, there, you got the website right there. Um, go go to the Start Here tab, and uh, I think that's a, a good place to start as per the name of the <laughs> of the page, right? Uh, so yeah, I'd, I'd recommend that. Uh, there's a lot of free Vani books uh, on that page, and if you do happen to, uh, you know, really appreciate Vani: The Search for Personal Freedom by Rayo, the the book that founded this podcast, essentially, then uh, you can go over to uh, you can find the link to uh, actually go get the the paperback copy of that uh, if you'd like to. So um, I will uh, stop rambling there. Uh, thanks so much uh, for tuning in, and uh, yeah, hope you have a uh, you know good holiday weekend, and uh, yeah, stay liberated, my friends. What is it? Well, security culture, briefly defined, is the direct application of the right to privacy. That's really just it. I mean, people can kind of uh, agree or disagree as to whether there is such a thing as the right to privacy, but the fact of the matter is that security culture is really applied privacy. Very good, very good. So uh, why, why is it important? Why should anyone, any, anyone give a damn? Well, people should give a damn about security culture because presumably many of them give a damn about privacy. There's been all sorts of advocates of privacy of one flavor or another. Sometimes they're so-called civil libertarians. Sometimes they are the free software um, promoters and and, and others. But the common revolving theme is is that somehow privacy is, is a good thing. So, yeah, if you care about privacy, you should also care about security culture because security culture is the very pragmatic implementation of, of, of the more abstract idea of privacy itself. So that's why it's important. It's actually doing privacy is what security culture is. Yeah, very good, very good, and uh, well said. Uh, so what could, be, uh, poten- uh, what could uh, pot- potential ramifications be to those who don't uh, practice security culture? Well, a lot of things. One is that you could be sued uh, because you were foolish and said a lot of things, whether to certain people who snitched on you or, as a variant on that, you said things publicly that perhaps you shouldn't because it's very easy to misconstrue things, especially considering 
all sorts of vested special interests will seize on something you've said publicly uh, and then try to use that as grounds for dragging you through the government's monopoly court system. Oh, geez, let's see. What are other possible consequences? Well, one Prison? consequence, <laughs> I was, yes, exactly, and I do mention that uh, throughout the uh, anthology that just got released, is uh, becoming a political prisoner because, uh, you know, you had pictures on fascist book or, you know, other similar things that I think is even covered in that, uh, that archive. I think you've got of those political prisoners. So there's lots of different consequences uh, that are already provable uh, when you don't take your uh, right to privacy seriously. Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. Uh, so uh, that's uh, kind of introduces security culture. Now what we're going to do is uh, examine uh, – there's three sections in this anthology. Section one, telecommunications. Uh, section two, information security. And section three, low-profile behavior. Uh, what we're going to do is just go through each of those articles and discuss the, the points that we, we find to be uh, important or crucial for your understanding. So uh, the first one in, uh, in uh, section one, telecommunications, is a history of dragnet wiretapping. Uh, we had Kyle on. This was the first broadcast we had Kyle on. Uh, it was on March 29th of 2015, and uh, we discussed this article uh, for two straight hours. So there's a lot of material there, so we're only going to cover this in passing. But uh, uh, but uh, someone in chat, uh, it was uh, Francisco, wanted to know if well, we are familiar with the Echelon Project. Uh, but first off, uh, why don't you just, I guess, a brief history of dragnet wiretapping for those who may not uh, know, what, know what it is. Uh, essentially, the National Security Agency, the NSA, has engaged in indiscriminate surveillance, or more specifically, dragnet wiretapping, pretty much ever since it was formulated in, in the 50s. Um, and, you know, there's all sorts of court case precedent and other government documents showing this to be the case, and uh, apparently the violations of the Fourth Amendment and all that notwithstanding, uh, that, that's pretty much what, what, what's going on here. So... Uh, the only other thing I'll say in passing here is that it's because of what I discovered about the history of dragnet wiretapping is why, and I'll repeat it here tonight, I advocate for the total and unequivocal abolishment of the National Security Agency immediately. I do. I, I do as well. I do as well. I mean, yeah, I mean, good place to start if it's possible, but uh, I say bring, bring, the, bring the whole uh – uh, the whole evil place down to the ground with all the agencies uh, as well. So, uh, okay, very good, very good. So, uh, uh, what is uh, the Echelon Project? How, how does this, how did this all kind of come together with uh, like the Five Eyes uh, segment and, and things things like that? Well, the UK USA agreement that was entered into uh, with some other um, signals intelligence agencies of those four other foreign governments basically formed the Five Eyes Intelligence Network. And this is what Ed Snowden was trying to tell people about before he was ignored by the corporate media eventually. And remember, Ed Snowden, when he whistle blew like three years ago, I think it was uh, as of last month, I think it was, was when he went public three years ago. So, yeah, I mean, Echelon is basically this project or government program treaty type of thing that basically uses a combination of underwater data cables and geostationary orbital uh, satellite uplinks and downlinks to essentially commit signals espionage uh, against uh, Americans as well as others. So I know people may get upset about uh, the legalities regarding uh, indiscriminate surveillance, but whether you know it's the USA Patriot Act Section 215, I think that's the library records provision, or we're talking about the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, uh, Section 702, a lot of that stuff is really quite irrelevant because Echelon is a complete runaround all of that. So it's, it's – Echelon is really what's important. People get really kind of tacked on to the legal stuff. Legal stuff doesn't really matter at the end of the day. What matters is Echelon because if the Australians and the New Zealanders and the British and so forth – can steal the content of your emails, of your phone calls, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't really matter what the hypothetical limits are against the NSA because they can get the exact same intelligence on Americans through their Five Eyes intelligence network. Exactly, exactly. And, and when I found out about that, it was it was kind of mind blowing because obviously I, I was a constitutional at one point. I uh, unfortunately, but uh, we all we all uh, most of us go through that. But uh, yeah, I mean, I was all for. Uh, I mean. Uh, 
<clears throat> I was all for, I guess, more restrictions on the NSA. But that, yeah, as, as you said, it doesn't really make it doesn't really make a damn difference because uh, uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, et cetera, et cetera, they don't have to abide by the Fourth Amendment. Uh, they're not subject to it because it's it's not the American government. So, uh, very, very good. Any, any uh, closing thoughts on uh, on uh, history of dragnet wiretapping? No. Please, yeah, so yes, pe- so yes, people should really read it if they want to know why I advocate not for the reform, but for the abolition of the NSA. Yep, yep. And I think, uh, isn't that uh, tinyurl.com forward slash dragnet wiretapping? Yes, I, I think that's so. the short link for that. Okay, so if you want to go check that out, uh, you can do so. tinyurl.com forward slash dragnet wiretapping. So data mining the haystack. Should you attempt to overload the NSA servers with suspicious keywords? Uh, again, we had Kyle on to uh, discuss this on February uh, 21st of this year. I think he talked about it for an hour. Uh, so we're just going to kind of blow, blow past this, uh, uh, blow past this. But uh, Kyle, anything you want to mention on the show here? Yeah, uh, El Presidente uh, Barack Obama, or whatever the hell his name is, Barry Sotero. I don't know. I can't keep up with this whole uh, background. That keeps changing every other minute. Uh, El Presidente basically mentioned back in July 7th of 2013 that, like, nobody's listening to your phone calls. Nobody's uh, looking at your emails. Everybody just calm down. It's only foreign intelligence surveillance. It's only metadata. Uh, He completely just, he either lied or he's so incompetently ignorant that he doesn't know what his own government is doing, that he's allegedly like the symbolic figurehead of. Either way, he doesn't deserve to be the president. Um, so that's pretty much the, the at least the one part on that. The other part of it is that you're not going to be able to overload the NSA servers with emails because you're using the that, – that's like saying you want to use the smallest conceivable file size – against the largest conceivable set of cloud computing servers. It's completely asinine, but nobody apparently nobody ever bothered to do the math, and I was probably the first one who did it. So, uh, yeah, 75 kilobytes does not, uh, e- cannot overwhelm uh, a Yodabyte. Sorry, just yeah. not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, and even for, even for smaller servers, like it would take ridiculous amounts of time to overload a server with emails. It would take so long. Uh, so yeah, I mean, th- there's a little naivety there uh, on the part of uh, on the ad- on the part of the advocates of, of, of that, I guess, uh, used to be pot- or former potential strategies. So, all right, very good, very good. So uh, we're going to stick with uh, cell phones here. Uh, the next article we will mention is uh, our cellular telephones furthering human liberty. Uh, so I guess Kyle, does the Fourth Amendment protect cell phones? Not from what I can tell. Um, the short version essentially is. How do I say this? There was something that came up in the court cases that I cited in the article where the federal judges were constantly saying over and over again that if you are suspected of any sort of criminal activity, you have no expectation of privacy. And yes, that would arguably apply to like the actual phone calls, like the wiretapping part of it. But in some ways, more importantly, that also applied to, I guess you could say, like the data mining, for lack of a better term of like the cell phone's contents, like, like as a computer, especially for, especially if it's a smartphone. Um, so, you know, does the fourth amendment protect cell phones? Every court case I cite in that article was pretty much a resounding no. And it was for different reasons. Um, uh, you know, I mean, hell in the court cases, especially one, it was mentioned that even diaries, diaries, like paper diaries, like what little girls use, do not enjoy Fourth Amendment protection against warrantless searches. Think about that for a moment. So if little girls' diaries aren't safe, even though the Fourth Amendment specifically says uh, the people have the right to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects, then if diaries aren't protected by the Fourth Amendment as papers, then what is? That's a rather uncomfortable question. And so when when you take it that, well, diaries aren't sacrosanct in the sense of having legal protection constitutionally, then I guess cell phones are are, are worse off, I suppose, unless I'm misunderstanding something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's, that's definitely true. And we'll get more into, I guess, uh, uh, obviously we're going to go through – 
how there really isn't any security uh, um, with with these various devices. And then what? Uh, and part two and part three, we'll get more into uh, how to attempt to uh, remedy that. So, uh, I guess uh, um, you've already mentioned cell phone. Cell phones can be wiretapped and data mined. I think everyone everyone essentially knows that. So we'll we'll move past that. Uh, so what is the what is the significance of Celebrite's UFED? Oh yeah, a lot of people don't know about Celebrite. This is a fascinating, uh, I think it's an Israeli company, interestingly enough, and so the conspiracists can go off on that angle if they really want to. Uh, but it's true, they are an Isra- Celebrite is an Israeli company, and they developed a data extraction device that they claim in their own corporate literature can... Um, well, hell, actually, let me read you just a, a quoted excerpt Right, that's right in the article that I did just uh, lift from one of their pamphlets. Uh, they said, quote, with it, meaning the UFED, uh, officers, private investigators, and lab examiners can quickly and effectively bypass device user locks, decrypt encrypted data from rapidly changing device operating systems, and recover texts, deleted emails, location information, and account profile data, uh, close quote. Now, do keep in mind, this is Celebrite bragging about the UFED. As far as I'm aware of, nobody has been able to perform any sort of security audits or any sort of like third party, uh, I guess you could say like a consumer report type of thing. Uh, No third parties, disinterested or otherwise, I don't think have actually tested whether the UFED can do what Celebrite claims it can do. So really, unfortunately, we're, we're... kind of relying on Celebrite's word. And of course, they have a vested interest because they market the UFED to uh, actually the government police pretty much exclusively from what I can tell. I don't think it's available on the civilian market unless someone wants to correct me on that. Uh, So yeah, it's uh, they're claiming it can uh, basically break everything that uh, that it's the crypt analytic uh, dream come true, as it were. And not only that, but also the portable uh, version of the UFED they claim can be used by police officers like at the side of the road to break into encrypted phones. So that's the claim they're making. I have no idea whether it's true or not, but apparently the device does exist. Yeah, and uh, that's uh, particularly scary, uh, particularly scary. But uh, I'd like to mention, I, I wrote an article, uh, anonymous, encrypted, uh, anonymous Encrypted Phones, Is It Possible? I'd like to kind of, to kind of just mention here briefly what I was able to find out. Uh, I guess the, the answer is yes, but there, there's always the caveat, which I'll get to at the end. Um, obviously, you can use pay phones uh, with prepaid cards that you buy with cash. Uh, that's, that's a pretty good way to do so, but your, your issue is going to be finding a damn uh, pay phone. Uh, I know here in uh, Bloomington Normal, I've lived here for almost 10 years. I've never seen a pay phone. So, I mean, if you have, if you have a pay phone in your area, I mean, or, or near you, uh, yeah, go for it. Uh, that's uh, not a bad way uh, for, for uh, uh, anonymity. Uh, using encryption applications on prepaid smartphones, uh, and when you're purchasing your prepaid your prepaid smartphone, uh, provide as little personally identifiable information as as possible, and pay with cash. Uh, if you go to that article, um, I don't have a short link for it, but uh, just anonymous encrypted phones is it possible? I actually called uh, like the four major companies and, and talked to them about their prepaid plans, and uh, there's there's little to no. Uh, personally identifiable, identifiable information necessary. So I think probably the best way, what I, like if I could recommend not being a tech a tech guy, uh, prepaid prepaid smartphones paid with cash. I don't have to give your name on 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 most of them, if not all of them, and uh, then just use encryption on it because uh, you can you can get apps that uh, use encryption. You can find all those in the article. I broke it down uh, for for uh, just messaging for VoIP calls, uh, like we're doing on Skype right now, uh, things of that nature. Well, or simply, I mean, I've got a, I've got an iPhone. Uh, you can just download encryption programs on on your contract smartphones as well. Uh, and this is this is one where I, I just found out about this a few months ago. But you can actually download Tor. Uh, you know, the Onion browser, the one that you have to use to access uh, uh, access uh, the deep web. Oh yeah, you can download download that uh, on uh, for, for mobile internet browsing. Uh, so here are the caveats. <clears throat> I'm not quite sure uh, how easy it is uh, for governments uh, to break into the encryption on iPhones. I, I really have no clue because um, that's that's not my specialty. So that that's one thing you got to be aware of. Um, yeah, and with that said, I would still proceed with with extreme caution uh, with anything that's extremely sensitive uh, or anything of that nature. And with that, uh, I mean, utilizing mail drops in paper format, not digital. 
uh, or face to face to face meetings are always the best. So, Kyle, uh, any any thoughts there? Well, I'm I'm glad that there is at least the possibility to have um, anonymously encrypted phones, and I know that the dark Android project is a specific effort to try and and do something uh, uh, something like that in a more systematic way. But I'm I'm really happy that it's at least possible now because if we were back in the 1990s. I don't think the technology was around to even, I mean, I can't remember seeing a smartphone in like 1997. So the fact that it's actually possible to do this now using ZRTP and OTR uh, protocols is actually rather exciting. Yeah, yeah, it, it definitely uh, it, it definitely is exciting. And, and, and worst case scenario, like like let's say like these programs, we can get like the government can break through these programs or, or something like that uh, or black hat hackers or whatever. I mean, you're you're you're. Put it. You're putting them through extra trouble to do so, uh, and I would say the majority of people don't use encryption on their phones, so uh, they're probably going to go for the easiest ones first. And if they really want your data, you're you're gonna you're gonna be a pain in the ass for them. So, uh, I mean, worst that's worst case scenario. Best case scenario, they they have they have trouble getting in. They can't get in, and uh, your information is secure. But I wouldn't hedge my bets on that. Just 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 because. Uh, anyways, so uh, so cell phones again. Is 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 the radiation emanating from cell phones harmful to human health? Well, according to the Journal of Microscopy and Ultrasound, they published a meta-analytic study in 2014, which mainly suggested that children were noticeably more affected by microwave radiation than adults are because they have thinner skulls, relatively smaller body sizes, and more absorbent brain tissues. How, and then having said that, though, there was also issues of the cell phone radiation actually adversely affecting male reproductive uh, viability specifically, uh, motility of sperm and, and, and such. So there's, there's some odd effects that it wasn't just so they, they first started by saying, well, it only really affects children. And then they said, well, it affects men too. So uh, yeah. there's, there's kind of some mixed uh, scientific evidence, but, it, but the, what has come out uh, really kind of shows that children and men – are, are adversely affected by cell phones. Uh, basically, uh, well, in fact, actually, one of the researchers mentioned about DNA fragmentation specifically. Yeah, yeah, and I I've, I know of at least a couple couple few examples. Like uh, a lot of girls will put their uh, put their phone in their bra, and they've actually so I've I, they're, uh, pro, there's probably it's probably not as rare as I think it is, but I, I know of at least a few cases where the the women actually develop breast cancer, and that was that was the cause of it or, or what the doctors said. So uh, yeah, there there's some some negative effects that can come from cell phones. There there definitely are, and I've also heard uh, don't sleep with the phone right next to your head. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know if that's if that. Uh, I don't know if there's any evidence to back that up. But but whatever, whatever. I'll figure. I mentioned I, that in passing. Go ahead, Jason. I just make a tinfoil hat, and it and it protects me from. <laughs> 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 there you go. There you go. Uh, Kyle, um, I don't know if you remember this, but uh, it's been quite a um, quite a while. But there was a company, uh, uh, a third party company, that was actually in the AT and T building. That had that had set up, and I, I believe it was an Israeli company, and they uh, essentially uh, mirrored the network, and were um, you know data collecting. I don't I don't know if you do you remember that story? It's been oh hell ten twelve years. I believe I mentioned something uh, similar to that in the history of Dragnet wiretapping uh, regarding Mark Klein, the AT&T technician who basically found the, the black room yeah. at the SBC communications building. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, and, and the, I, I did mention that. And basically the court case uh, basically essentially went nowhere. Um, the lawsuit didn't work, and so Mark Line's testimony was thrown out, mainly because the judges considered him to be an incompetent witness. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's in my article kind of summarizing what happened, and I do link to the court case. So you can actually read what the judge wrote in its entirety if you want to pursue that. But, yeah, um, <laughs> th there's a lot of things relating to the history of Dragnet wiretapping, whether it's suing the NSA or some other things that unfortunately uh, certain things just didn't pan out. And so, yes, there's a reason why I usually try to focus more on, on, on seeing what the developments are with like free and open source software and providing some sort of like digital encryption. Because frankly, I mean, the legal interstices really have been exhausted as far as I can tell. Well, 
your best bet for like an iPhone would be pro probably jailbreaking it. I don't know if you've heard, but um, uh, I think Apple came out this week or in the last uh, couple weeks. They were talking about how they can essentially shut down everyone's video at a, at a, like a concert. I, don't. I I wasn't aware of that particular development, although what you said did remind me of something that is in one of my articles. Uh, remember, James Comey, there was that whole FBI-Apple encryption dispute. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and then people were saying, like, oh, Apple is standing for privacy. And when that was going on, all I could think of is that this is the same Apple that was, like, harassing their own users because of, of the whole jailbreaking thing like you just mentioned. But Kyle, before into the break, you were mentioning the Apple encryption. Uh, with uh, um, a people are praising uh, Apple for uh, not just uh, breaking the encryption on that uh, San Bernardino iPhone, uh, but they're the ones that were mad at uh, their customers for jailbreaking their phones. And actually, yeah, my my brother jailbroke his his i it was actually just uh, what were they called? iTouches, like the old ones that like they're like iPhones, but they didn't have uh, 4G or, or wireless. Yeah, on them. The, the iTouch. Yeah, they, they were yeah. they were like the fancier um uh, ipod or whatever yeah, yeah 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 so so he he, jail, he jailbroke his but yeah it's, it's out of warranty when you do that but uh, kyle you want to you know uh, do you want to finish your thought on that sure it's it's just that you know this assumption that apple is somehow uh some big privacy advocate kind of flies in the face of their earlier history uh and of course that's before we even get to ed snowden Back in 2013, saying that Apple was a uh, Prism partner or at least complicit with Prism or something to that effect. So it's kind of like, wow, geez, you know, can, guys, can we like look at the actual history, both uh, the good and bad actions of whichever actor we're talking about, in this case, Apple, and then fairly judge whether they actually give a damn about privacy instead of this knee jerk reaction through the news cycle that just because they decide to give the FBI director in this one case study regarding the San Bernardino shooter some grief over, well, we don't want to compromise our you know, encryption on our iPhones, that somehow now they've magically turned 180 degrees uh, based on principle. I mean, come on, give me a break. Yeah, yeah, that's, that, that's definitely a good point. That's definitely a good point. Um, so... This is an interesting question. I'm going to try to get Mr. Producer queue up uh, to get people running into holes. It's perfect for this. Perfect for this question and answer. So, Kyle, have people become addicted to their cell phones? Well, you know, Pew Research Center had released some studies over the years where, let's see, uh, depending on your what generation you belong to, your you know, cellular telephone ownership can be in the 90th percentile, like 92% if you're a Gen X or 95% if you're a millennial. Um, other Pew studies basically showed things ranging from people who use cell phones to alleviate boredom, uh, even to deliberately avoid interacting with people in their immediate vicinity, like think like lines at the grocery store, for example. Um, uh, you know, there's there's the rudeness of people while they're talking on a cell phone uh, in the sense of being rude against people who are physically in their presence, even when they should put the damn phone down and like, you know, pay the bill or whatever the activity is in the moment that they should be doing. Um, I mean, or know, drive to the damn stoplight. Sure. Well, whatever the specific activity is, and I think people over the years are kind of familiar with a lot of that annoying uh, behavior, so I won't take up precious air time going through all of that, except to say there was also a different study by Ohio State University that mentioned about distracted walking. People literally, <laughs> literally walking in the middle of the road, or my personal favorite, walking off bridges, literally, oh because God. they were on their cell phones. So you ask me, are people addicted to their cell phones? It's like, well, there's at least a portion of those cell phone owners who use their cell phone so irresponsibly that they are basically flouting social custom or even to their own detriment, walking off bridges and getting injured. So you tell me if they're addicted or not. You know, it's it's really sad that they even ha like they even thought to conduct that study. Like that's bad <laughs> enough. Like like okay, I wonder I wonder if people are walking off bridges and like walking through the middle of roads. Like, 
Let's let's see what we can find out here. Like obviously it happened a, a few times. So like, well, I wonder, I wonder what the actual like statistics are are, are on this. But uh, but yeah, I mean th- this is the I mean this is the zombie apocalypse. I've said I don't know if I said it on the broadcast, but here's my I guess my conspiracy theory of the day. Uh, but uh, like like it wasn't too, like obviously the zombie like the zombie shows and movies. I don't remember why. I don't know when the first one came out, but probably probably not too long ago. I would imagine. But uh, my my theory is that. Uh, <clears throat> Like people, some people actually think there's going to be a zombie, a zombie apocalypse, and I mean that's that's really, 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 really unlikely. But I think what they're doing with like the TV and the movies is like just mocking people, like just mocking people. Like you know we're talking about you, bud. You know we are. <laughs> <laughs> well, the whole zombie apocalypse uh, imagery and, and perhaps metaphor is really, and this is getting maybe into a different subject for another time, but it's really a critique of democracy, isn't it? Oh, we're all going to vote and we're all going to steal our neighbor's property through the ballot box or through referendums or through these political devices of state nullification or whatever else. So, you know, the zombie apocalypse, as far as I can tell, it's not a critique of uh, anarchy. It is not a critique even of monarchy even. It is really a critique of democracy and perhaps even of limited government as well. Yeah, yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Jason, uh, you got anything you want to add? No, no. no. Uh, they, I mean, they, they're working on um, the zombie apocalypse, but I mean, it's kind of, uh, I don't know, uh, people living in a fantasy world, and I don't know. I guess it's, if it gets people pre- prepared, I'm, I guess I'm okay with that. I'm fine with that. Yeah, get prepared, yeah, people. but... Get but... prepared. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I don't. I don't think. Uh, and I think. Uh, uh, let me see. When, uh, I remember it was in something we did, Kyle, uh, in a video, in a LUA Radio special edition or something. But the the worst thing you can do is scare people into like certain things. Like you want them to be like principled uh, when when they go to do when when they go to prepare or whatever it is or volume or et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, let's go ahead and move forward here. Uh, dual layer encryption: a proposal for sidestepping potential backdoors. And this is where Kyle's creativity came into play. Um, and, uh, I mean, it, it came from, uh, gear, it was the idea from Gary Hunt, but, uh, uh, I'll put it, Kyle put it on paper. So, uh, I guess first off, uh, for those who may not know what crypto anarchism is or, uh, encryption, uh, what is encryption? I guess encryption could be, uh, briefly defined in a very vernacular sense is essentially scrambling, uh, you know, normal language. Uh, scrambling it, or what the cryptologists would call uh, plain text, scrambling it into kind of this jumbled mess that you can't tell what it is, which would be your ciphertext, uh, you know, uh, at least in one sense, so that to prevent, uh, you know, hostile third parties from reading your messages that were originally intended only for some other, like, recipient, who, of course, would have a way of decrypting uh, the encrypted message and so forth. So basically, encryption is essentially a way of making sure that messages from the sender to the recipient actually are communicated without third parties intercepting the communication and thus uh, twisting it to their own ends. Very good, very good. And uh, we'll get into some of the various uh, programs uh, here momentarily. But uh, so you, you mentioned how does it work? Uh, has it has it ever been have it, has it ever been tested uh, the dual layer encryption that you you kind of proposed? Um, I don't want to say too much about that for reasons of information security. Other than what I will say here publicly is that I have asked in my article to of the uh, American Cryptogram Association to do some security audits. I think was what I was implying, uh, so that they can test dual the method of dual layer encryption. And, and see if they can find, like, any single points of failure or just, just other problems with it. Um, so has it been tested? Uh, not, in, not in the sense of, like, a security audit that's been made available publicly. Um, but you have to keep in mind that dual-layer encryption is essentially a blending of low-tech cryptography with high-tech uh, cryptographic software. So, for example, if you're going to use something, I, and I don't recommend this specific classical cipher because it's actually really easy to break. But, if, for example, if you were to take something like Playfair and, you know, use graph paper and, you know, encrypt your message uh, that more traditional way, and then you were to simply, like, type it into, uh, like, you know, 
an email client that already ha- was configured with PGP, and you can then send it to somebody who then, because of prior arrangements and so forth, they could essentially uh, <laughs> uh, decrypt it both using PGP on their end, and then once they see the first layer decrypted, they can then you know copy it on their graph paper and uh, and you know use uh, and, and to kind of decrypt it by hand in that sense. So that's that that's that's kind of the idea. But um, as far as I'm aware of, no, there hasn't been any security audits and all or anything like that. And I've tried to get the wheels in motion, but it's probably going to take some time uh, to to try and figure out if there's uh, if it's going to be like 100 percent bulletproof or whatever. But as far as I'm aware of, no one else has actually tried to blend. And the value of dual encryption is blending low tech with high tech. I don't think anybody's even tried that before. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've never, I hadn't heard of it before, uh, before your article, and it's, it seems like a, I mean, obviously for for very very uh, uh, for information security uh, matters. I mean, seems like the the best way to do it because, uh, uh, yeah, we'll we'll get to this. Well, actually, we'll we'll get to my, uh, I guess, uh, my concern or I guess a potential concern for for folks. Uh, let's move on to uh, how to configure and use PGP for encryption uh, and PGP encryption for email. Uh, do you have anything else you want to mention on dual layer encryption, or are we get to move forward? Let's let's keep going. Okay. Okay. So, uh, how to configure and use PGP encryption for email? This is a tutorial that uh, Kyle uh, put together, uh, and he has one for Windows uh, and Windows operating system and Mac OS too. I'm, I'm pretty sure he has them for both. But uh, first off, what is uh, what is PGP? Well, pretty good privacy is a type of digital mail encryption program. Um, essentially, the problem with sending emails out naked, uh, or let's say the traditional way. It's, it's a lot like sending a postcard through the, you know, government mail, uh, where basically any, like, third parties can just, like, flip over the other side and can read what you're saying to, the, to your uh, the recipient and so forth. Uh, PGP is basically the, the digital equivalent of a sealed envelope. So for those people who don't like to rely on postcards but instead send their letters or bills or documents through the government mails in an envelope, uh, you are also the same people who should have zero problem uh, using PGP because it's essentially the same thing, just a digital version of it. So that's what it is. It's basically a digital sealed envelope. Okay, very, very good. Yep, and uh, yeah, I definitely recommend PGP. I use it. Kyle uses it. You can find our, our keys, uh, public keys. Uh, and we're going to get uh, all of the uh, codes on Liberty Under Tax Ed with PGP as well. It's really, really easy to do. Um, so you've, you've already covered why you should encrypt your email, uh, and uh, uh, I guess this kind of, was kind of covered in, dual, in the dual layer encryption part. But but how does how does PGP work specifically? Basically, PGP works. I don't want to get into the technical stuff for purposes of time, but essentially, it relies on something called public key cryptography, which is a very ingenious way of using both private and a uh, key pair, both a public key and a private key, to securely encrypt communications between your uh, between the senders and the recipient. Uh, it's a very interesting and novel way of doing it. And originally, uh, you actually had to buy PGP from the PGP Corporation, but in years since, uh, there's been uh, the free and open source implementation of PGP uh, for different operating systems where all you have to do is go click, 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 and download it and, and you know, again, freely downloadable versions based on the open PGP standard. Uh, that you can use to encrypt your emails, and it's gotten a lot more user friendly as time goes, go, has gone on. And um, you know, I've I've actually offered you know free tech support to people, and still do uh, to uh, help them config uh, you know install and configure PGP, uh, which I think is actually something that people can do. You know, there's there's a lot of people who claim that they're activists, so called, and we're activists. We're going to go on the streets and protest and yell about our grievance of the week or whatever. But they don't want to do a lot of things. They're not very big on actual direct action. And, you know, some types of direct action do require, uh, do require uh, essentially some degree of either traveling around or, uh, you know, investing a little bit of, of money into something or whatever. What's interesting about using PGP is that you don't have to travel anywhere. So it's not like a political field trip. And you don't need to invest in any stuff or a lot of it or even – you know, it's not like food storage, like what the survivalists do, right? Where you need to like pop down, you know, a couple hundred dollars for a decent year's worth of food storage. PGP is not anything like that. Is it's like as long as you have electricity and an internet connection, 
you can use PGP like today if you really wanted to. It's very user friendly. Very, I mean, it's the cost is it's it's not even there. Uh, yeah. it's, it's kind of really wonderful the development of all that. So the tutorial basically kind of just describes uh, at least one way of how to. Uh, go ahead and uh, configure and install that. And by the way, if anybody wants to help me put together a version, a tutorial version for Linux, I would love the assistance because I want to make sure all the op- major operating systems are covered. Right now it's uh, Mac OS X and Windows, but if anybody wants to help me with uh, putting together one for Linux and especially taking the screenshots, which is what I would need, uh, I'd love to do that. Fantastic, fantastic! Yeah, someone, someone take, someone take him up on that offer. Uh, but yeah, it, it's it's really, really, really easy to use. I mean, uh, a lot of people have this, this, uh, I guess this, uh, this idea that like encryption is like you, you've got to go through like uh, all of the, you've got to actually do the coding and stuff. It's it's not it's not like that. It's not like that. You download uh, you download a couple things, uh, and I mean, it took me. I think it probably took me thirty minutes or an hour to set up. I don't remember specifically. It's been it's been a year now, but uh, it's really easy to set up. There's there's real there's really no excuse. I mean, like you're already you might already. I mean, email is kind of a little bit obsolete for some people. But uh, I mean, if you if you use email, it's so easy to do. You you might as well do it. Um, so, Kyle, are there any potential backdoors to PGP? None that are known to be around. And Phil Zimmerman, the creator of PGP, specifically said there are no backdoors. He did not hand over anything to the government or anything like that. But you know, hey, for people that are a little bit more, uh, let's just say, overly cautious, again, uh, you, may, you know, just consider using dual layer encryption at that point. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I have every confidence that PGP is perfectly fine, but, you know, if you don't want to take my word for it, then use dual layer encryption and get off my back. Very good, very good. Uh, so I'm, we've only got about two and a half minutes till break. I'm just going to run through, uh, this was the tutorial I put together, how to configure and set up Jitsi, which is a program that uh, you can do a voice call. It's, it's like Skype. Uh, it's, it's not as fluid as Skype is uh, as far as, I don't know, it's, 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 a free, it's a free program, it's encryption, it's open source. So, uh, I mean, it, it works well. It works well as a, as a good backup to, to, to other things like, like Mumble and such. But, okay, so, yeah, so that, that's what Jitsi is. ZRTP is Zimmerman Real-Time Protocol, which is uh, encryption for, for voice calls, uh, like for, for Skype, essentially. Um, and uh, OTR, off the record, is for messaging. Uh, so you can type your messages encrypted. Uh, <clears throat> the biggest question, is, is it easy to configure I figured it out, put together the, the tutorial. So yes, it is easy to configure. You just go to uh, my Jitsi dot. I, I, if you just Google Jitsi, you can find it. I don't remember if it's Jitsi dot org or Jitsi dot com. But you download the program, uh, and you have to have somebody to help you set it. You have to have you have to have someone to, to test out the. Obviously, if, if you're going to be downloading Jitsi, you, you have people that you want to communicate with through it. Um, but you download it, you exchange the keys, uh, and then when you have a voice call, you'll have to confirm four numbers or four numbers or letters or something along those lines. It's all in the tutorial. Uh, but it's really, really easy to set up. I mean, it takes no no more than 30 minutes, uh, and it could take even as, as, as less as uh, 15 or 20. Um, the other thing you have to do is uh, um, for, for Fat Cow, you have to get uh, – what's the server called, Kyle? Uh, XMPP, I think it is. XMPP server. Yeah, but it, but it's but it's through DuckDuckGo. Yes, through through DuckDuckGo. Yep. So you 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 uh, create an account with DuckDuckGo, and uh, then you log in with that information through the XMPP server. And that may sound complicated. It's really really not. Go check out the tu- tutorial, uh, how to configure and set up Jitsi. Just type in Jitsi. Uh, if you type that in, the, the uh, my tutorial will come up. So, um, yeah, I definitely recommend it. Uh, really, really easy to use uh, as well. But like I said, it's it's not a major program like Skype. So there are there are a few bugs to it. But for just simple voice calls, uh, it's really it's 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 really a really really good program. And you can also uh, like when Kyle and I record spoken discourse. Sometimes we sometimes do it through Jitsi. Uh, you can re- you can uh, record phone calls and, and all that good stuff. Make sure you have the other person's permission if it's a two party state. So Kyle, I kind of blew through Jitsi. There was anything you wanted to mention uh, in regards to it? No, that was that was it. I mean, really, the only thing is that the solution is not go- the solution to indiscriminate surveillance and dragnet wiretapping, etc., is not government law, but rather free market technology. And there are free market technologies that are available now that weren't available back in the '90s, uh, such as. Uh, you know, ZRTP and OTR, uh, you know, for VoIP and 
instant messaging specifically. So that that's what I'm really more excited about are, are the developing of those technologies. And really the next step is really to have security audits, uh, at least for some of them. Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, well, I just noticed that, uh, yeah, Section 1 took an hour to do. Uh, so uh, there's, there's a lot of material to cover. But Section 2 is information security. And the first one uh, that we're going to cover is your article titled "How uh, <laughs> uh, Socialist Insecurity, How the Raw Deal Enslaved Americans. Uh, so what is uh, social security, Kyle? <laughs> social security is the American implementation of social insurance – which is based and social insurance itself is basically just socialized retirement. And it's a Ponzi scheme, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, yes, indeed, it is. Uh, so I guess uh, uh, this is the uh, this is security culture. So what what the hell does does social security have to do with privacy? Well, it's interesting, right? I mean, people can go kind of go in a lot of different directions when it comes to social security. There's there's the legal issues, there's the economic issues, but for purposes of tonight, it's really the privacy issues that are what's relevant to security culture. And this is really revolving around the social security numbers. And it's interesting because, and this is, goes into more detail in the actual article, which I r really uh, suggest the listeners really read on their own time or listen to, uh, as there are audio versions of all of these articles. Uh, but essentially, uh, Social Security is voluntary, except that there are these, uh, well, exceptions regarding uh, taxes and vehicle registration and driver licensure and I think some other things, where basically uh, these exceptions to the rule of Social Security being voluntary are so huge and gaping that really the rule almost doesn't matter, except it is so it becomes more of a legal technicality. So yes, Social Security is voluntary, but the exceptions to it are coercive. And, uh, and the problem here is that the exceptions to Social Security are broader than the rule itself. So in effect, it is in the real world not, le not legal land, but in the real world, Social Security is unfortunately coercive by default. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Try, try getting a. I mean, even before you even get a job, and I've been going through this myself, uh, trying to try and find at least a part-time job. Uh, I mean, they want your social security number when you're filling out the job application, uh, which obviously that's for the background checks and all of that. But, uh, but even prior to prior to employment, you have to enter the social security number, uh, and that's just one example. I'm sure. Uh, um, I know at the DMV here in, in the common state of Illinois, you have to have two forms of identification. It doesn't necessarily have to be a social security, but most people go with like social security and like a utility bill or something, uh, whatever whatever it is. Uh, so try living your life without that social security card. Uh, yes, it's voluntary, uh, but you could uh, you could put you you could uh, uh, really really restrict yourself uh, very very quickly if you decided to uh, ever uh, cut up your social security card or. or uh, or uh, what's it called? Uh, I guess to just remove it from the registry or whatever it is, you'd, you'd be in. A, you'd, you'd have some trouble to say the least. Well, so well, social security numbers are the de facto national identification uh, scheme. That's what it is. So I know people a couple years back, or actually last decade, were really concerned about the implementation of like uh, a national ID card. But in all honesty. The social security number really is it. Like everything is centralized onto there. Your credit ratings, uh, you know, anything really uh, at some point has to go through that bottleneck of the SSN. Very, very true. Very true. So, so when you when you uh, get when if you're if you're above board, uh, like in my last job, uh, obviously social security is already taken out. Um, so. I guess it, is, am I owed my Social Security benefits? No, no, you're not. And and the case law that is in uh, my article on Social Security goes through this, and probably the most important one was the Fleming versus Nestor case, where there is no contract. Let me just say that because the listeners really need to understand this, because there's this really bad misconception, inaccurate misconception that somehow if you pay into Social Security, quote-unquote, uh, then that somehow means you're owed the Social Security checks, really a welfare handout with like food stamps, which is what it really is, that you're owed this welfare handout once you reach the artificial retirement age of whatever the hell it is, but they keep raising the retirement age. Um, no, th there is no contract. So just say that to yourself. There is no contract. There is no contract. There is no contract. 
and the federal judges have said so repeatedly. There is no contract. You're not owed a penny from the Social Security Administration. Stop telling yourselves this incorrect idea legally that you are owed Social Security once you hit 65 or 67 or whatever the retirement age this week happens to be. Hey, Kyle. It's not true. Hey, Kyle, is there, is there a contract? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I struggle. I struggle to like get my mind around this. Uh, Shane and I was talking one night, and I was like, I, I I don't understand. You know that that's your money, and he said he you know he's finally got you know he's tired of ex- trying to explain it to me. He's like, here, read this article from Kyle, <laughs> and I read it, and I was like, oh shit. Okay, I completely understand what's going on here now. It's not like you're putting money into an actual account that, you know, that is set aside for the individual. It's basically, yeah, just a welfare fund. You know, it's, you're throwing into a pot and, you know, hopefully one day when you get to that magical age that, that you might get something. It's And it's not required. It's not owed to you. I, I, I can see people's point like, hey, that's my money. I've been paying into it. I see where they're coming from, but when you boil it down to what it actually really is, it's 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 welfare. Well, I'm glad. Well, I'm glad it, it definitely helped you. Uh, I think part of the problem too here. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I think part of the problem too is that people are really not understanding the nature of the situation we're all suffering under. You know, they they support government. They they like authoritarianism. But they don't really want to, even for their own intellectual honesty. Like, I mean, think about this. If somebody is pro-government, they like the taxes, they like the military, they like the welfare state, etc., etc., etc. Don't you think in order to be an advocate of all that, they would want to understand, if not in in terms of the 20 million different details, but at least in broad overview brushes, the actual accurate information about what it is they're advocating for. So when you see the Bernie Sanders supporters say something like, we want to strengthen Social Security, right? That's one of his platforms, one of the things he's promoting. Shouldn't you like understand something about what it actually is and how it actually works and the fact that the latest projections are that Social Security is going bankrupt sometime in the 2030s? And that's according to the trust funds, the OSID's trust fund uh, uh, reports, their own reports. I mean, come on, please. I mean, can there be some intellectual honesty here first and then we can and then people can make their own individual decisions in terms of I like government, I don't like government, et cetera, et cetera. Regarding Social Security, a lot of people just really don't understand the history of it, what it really means. They don't read the case law. Uh, probably more importantly, they're economically illiterate and they don't read like the actual trustee reports like I did and what their own projections were of, of, of you know, when, when the so-called trust funds are going to get exhausted. So, you know, they'll, they'll do the Bernie Sanders routine of uh, we need to strengthen Social Security, but then they actually don't objectively try to actually understand what it is and what its current condition is. And that's just that's just what what it is. Very good, very good. So let's uh, let's go ahead and move forward here. Uh, uh, Kyle's uh, another of Kyle's articles in this uh, anthology is: Do you have the right to be forgotten? Uh, so first off, uh, just, what is the right to be forgotten? What is what is the concept? Oh gosh, this. Okay, well, it stems from this French concept of le droit et l'oubli, meaning the right of oblivion. Uh, it essentially asserts that individuals deserve to not have their futures dictated by past actions. Um, that's, I guess, the short way of putting it. Um, obviously, people may take issue with that, especially considering uh, things like embarrassing youthful indiscretions, uh, people who became debtors, even if they did pay it off, uh, as as a fellow uh, fellow's case we're going to get to here shortly, uh, or even convicted felons. So uh, I guess the right to be forgotten is kind of uh, – Trying to throw the notion of like uh, of of like someone's reputation, their reputational history, completely into a cock hat. Okay, very very good. So it's essentially, it's uh, uh, they don't. Uh, it's 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 based around uh, not having people uh, take responsibility for their mistakes in the past. Essentially, uh, that's def- at least one aspect. That's definitely like a good operating definition. I mean, do keep in mind, um, I know this may sound strange coming from me. I guess there are some shades of gray when it comes to this. 
but unfortunately, the way that it's been promoted is basically um, it's a form of censorship against the free press is, is kind of where it's kind of gone. But, yeah, that's the right to be forgotten. Uh, getting your own personal histories scrubbed after the fact. OK, very, very good. And you mentioned a case. Uh, let's talk about it. What is the significance of the Google Spain versus Gonzalez case? Oh, yeah, this was uh, two years ago in 2014 when the uh, – the European Union, to bring them up yet again, because I know the Brexit has been in the news lately. Well, the European Union's Court of Justice had this case where they were trying to adjudicate the meaning of what they call Directive 9546EC. And um, it was actually specifically Article 12, Paragraph B, that mentions about the erasure or blocking of data, uh, especially in cases of incomplete or inaccurate na nature of the data. So that's kind of like the legal basis behind the so-called right to be forgotten, except when as applied in the Gonzalez case. Um, the problem is that Gonzalez, he, he was a debtor, okay? So, like, there's no slander, libel, or defamation here. Like, he was badly in debt. Like, this is something that happened. Now, for his own sake, he did thankfully pay it off later, but unfortunately, I think what got the whole thing started was he was denied a, a, like a loan or a mortgage or something uh, because uh, the uh, the bank officers actually would type type you know go type on the internet and found that he used to have like back taxes or whatever it was uh, that he allegedly owed, and and somehow this made him a credit risk. So eventually this whole thing got litigated up the various uh, courts up into, you know, the super state of the EU where they basically said that, yeah, there is such a thing as a right to be forgotten. And, yeah, Gonzalez does deserve to have the search indices on Google, not the actual websites that hosted the information about his past history, but the search results on Google scrubbed. So that's the only thing mm. we're talking about here regarding the case. This isn't. As applied in the Gonzalez case, it wasn't we're going to go uh, use you know intellectual property or, or some other excuse to go shut down these websites, like a DMCA claim type of thing. No, 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 no. It was we're going to go after Google and, and say you must remove the, the search indices. And also keep in mind, too, that the original Gonzalez case was focused not on uh, Google search indices globally, but it was focused on those portions that can be accessed from the European Union, from Europe. So, for example, if you were to look up about Mr. Gonzalez, like here, you know, on this side of the pond or in other parts of the world, you could – the search indices would still be the same. So, you see, this was actually a very limited applicability uh, uh, against – I think it was Google Europe or whatever it's called. Google Spain, actually, mm -hmm. specifically. That would really only apply to Gonzalez. So, this is rather kind of limited. But, unfortunately, this is the problem with statism is that, you know, you let these people, the, the, the black-robed men, you let them put get their foot in the door, and then it, once that happens, it'll eventually, the door will get swung wide open at some point in the future. But as far as the Gonzalez case goes, that was the foot in the door for this right to be forgotten. Okay, okay, very, okay, uh, very good, very good. So uh, is this happening in the United States? Thankfully, not as of yet. Unfortunately, though, uh, there was a, a bureaucrat or two from uh, the administrative agency, specifically, I think it was the Federal Trade Commission, if I remember correctly, that uh, basically said, well, maybe not the full version of the right to be forgotten that's been litigated in the European Union recently, but maybe something like a nicer, cuddlier right to oblivion, which was the original French concept that I mentioned earlier. Uh, where where people can like scrub some stuff after it basically was the same thing except it was more of a technological application instead of a a, a legal one because of course of the of that pesky Fourth Amendment. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so we are in uh, and for for the sake of the listeners, I changed my mind. We are going to take this final break. We are not even halfway through section two, uh, so we're definitely going we're definitely going to go into overdrive. Uh, today, so uh, yeah, we are going to take this final break just because I, I, I unfortunately, or probably, well, or fortunately, unfortunately, depending on your, your subjective preference, uh, we're definitely going to to be going over in, in this broadcast. Uh, so yeah, final break. Still time to call in two one eight eight nine five three eight one eight or on Skype at PR on Radio Live. And uh, when we come back, uh, yeah, we'll just uh, we'll be uh, getting uh, into some, some some really good stuff. And uh, again, we'll be uh, we'll definitely be going over this evening. So stay tuned. We'll be right back after this short break. That was our final break for the evening. We still got a lot to get through. Uh, it's a major, major subject uh, topic that we're that we're discussing tonight, 
And uh, I mean, yeah, obviously, uh, seven or eight hours of an audiobook and uh, about 250 pages for the uh, for the PDF version. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I can't say I'm really surprised that uh, we are in this position. Uh, typically, uh, when we have Kyle on, it's a pretty major topic. So, welcome back, guys. Uh, let's get right into it. So, before we went to break, we we're talking about uh, the right to be forgotten. Uh, and Kyle was going over the Google Spain versus Gonzalez case. Uh, and then he kind of went over, uh, if, uh, discussed uh, whether this is happening or not in the United States. So, uh, Kyle, what, what are the potential ramifications uh, from this uh, right to be forgotten? Well, the, the biggest one is basically a sort of roundabout way for the government to justify censorship, right? So if you – let, let's say you're a citizen journalist in the alternative media as uh, those of us listening are. Uh, if you basically break a story about uh, somebody's malfeasance or tyrannical uh, what happenings, such as a local city council or, or some other things, or maybe even a con artist who swindled uh, people out of their uh, donation money, which has happened many times before as well, no, uh, if any of them decide, hey, I'm Luke Radowski and I want to exercise my right to be forgotten, well... That kind of uh, is not kind of a little bit of an uncomfortable situation for those of us who actually went through all the work of, you know, documenting uh, his malfeasance or uh, or I could, you know, rattle off some other names. But for purposes of time, I won't. But basically, you but basically, if you're a citizen journalist and somebody tries to exercise their so-called right to be forgotten and in part of that, they want to rip down your articles, your videos, your podcasts, et cetera, et cetera. Because you mentioned them by name and went into detail about their provable actions that are on the public record and so forth. Well, that sounds a lot like the memory hole from George Orwell's 1984, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Just imagine if, uh, I don't know, the National Liberty Alliance uh, did that to me, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> which are to move uh, three, I think three videos, uh, or two, two videos, a uh, broadcast, and uh, an article. Uh, or if I don't, I don't think uh, he's going to do this. But like, if Gavin, if Gavin Syme or however you pronounce his name, Gavin Siam, if he were to do the same thing for my uh, rebuttal, his re rebuttal to his uh, view on anarchism, uh, yeah, that would fare very, very badly for me because I really, I really like those articles and they were important. Uh, so yeah, the, this whole right to be forgotten stuff, uh, it needs to, it needs to go away. It needs to go away uh, because the, there are a lot of uh, really negative ramifications, and it, it is, it is censorship. Uh, it is censorship. So I guess uh, uh, – so Kyle, let's say uh, uh, it does come to the United States or, or let's or, – uh, two, two scenarios. If it's, it's here in the United States uh, or it's coming in the next few years, how do, how do you defend against uh, this relatively new concept? Well, I think something that's been kind of brought up in private conversations with various uh, you know, alternative media content producers is basically a kind of in, – in essence, emulate the example that many uh, – YouTubers have done where you basically archive and mirror the material on multiple different websites. So what the YouTubers did for people who don't know, they would download other people's videos and then re-upload it on their own channels. And that became known as mirroring. Uh, and so some, so in a kind of similar vein, if you have a citizen journalist of some kind who's at risk of having their articles, uh, podcasts, etc., at risk of being taken down, whether it's due to something like a DMCA or, as is the case here, somebody is uh, claiming, I have a right to be forgotten and your article is making me quite memorable, uh, then yeah, then if that same article, podcast, whatever media we're talking about was on, say, two dozen different websites, well, that person exercising their so-called right to be forgotten, uh, which at this point almost sounds like a civil right, which is its own kind of uh, conundrum all by itself, government granting rights supposedly but that's getting that's a philosophical topic for another time uh the, that the so-called right to be forgotten well that that would be like 20 different some odd websites they would have to go down and start harassing each one of those so basically it just becomes that's really some yeah yeah as, as, a, as, a, as opposing to only harassing like less than a handful of people where that actually is doable especially if you go to the original uh, source and get rid of the original source, cut it off at the root, and then congratulations, you've now just made censorship happen in, in the land of the free, no less. So yeah, the right to be forgotten, I think, can be defended against even if the federal government decided to formally incorporate into legal structure, especially in terms of like Fourth Amendment jurisprudence. Uh, but thankfully, as of today anyway, uh, that's not really been the case. I mean, the worst it's really gotten 
besides some statements from some bureaucrats that are in my article, is that there's a couple like uh, surveys where there's some people who basically said over 50 percent or, or thereabouts saying that, yeah, we want a right to be forgotten in the United States. But that that's that's the farthest it's, it's gotten. So, uh, no, thankfully, there is not a civil right to be forgotten. If you do say something in the public domain on the historical record and so forth, uh, it's it's kind of there. So maybe perhaps people should guard their own mouths uh, and not demand that other people uh, censor themselves. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that, that's definitely true, and that, and that's why I mean, uh, Bipcot no government license on my site. Kyle, mostly all of Kyle's stuff. Uh, he's he's definitely fine with you marrying his stuff. We appreciate a, a link back, but if you don't, we're not going to be dicks to you and, and, and use uh, government violence. Um, but uh, but yeah, nonetheless, feel feel free to mirror anything on the Libertarian Tech website. I'm sure Kyle is completely fine with mirroring stuff off his site. I know I do it quite a bit, so uh, definitely uh, definitely uh, do that. Uh, <laughs> we don't want uh, all of our work to just uh, disappear down uh, down said memory holes. So, uh, Kyle, what, what is the, the significance of the uh, Oblivion computer program? Well, just briefly put, the Oblivion program was basically this – it was proposed roughly about a year ago or so – where they wanted to basically streamline in a very scalable and automated manner – technologically speaking, the right to be forgotten, where it would essentially it would be automated. So in other words, the idea was that if you basically just hop on the internet and you go and you use the Oblivion program, you would provide your government-issued identification, and then it would use like facial recognition and a couple other things to basically like scan the internet, essentially, for any references to you, and then it would red flag any matches for analysis, and that results of that red flagging would then go before a human being, let's say at Google, and then they would actually have to actually like enforce it. So really all that Oblivion would do at this point is basically uh, streamline it. But then again, I mean, I think, I don't think it was really a completely unreasonable for me to say in the article that would it really take that much of a difference in terms of the coding for Oblivion to where it wouldn't be limited to people who just play, placed a request like, I am John Doe, I want to be forgotten, you know, please red flag any references to me and, and Google, please erase me or whatever. Think about if you're like one of those uh, black operations, special forces types working illegally and such, which is what black operations are. Uh, if you wanted to disappear somebody forcibly, was it really that much of a stretch that they wouldn't use something like an altered version of Oblivion to literally dis- disappear you from the face of the planet? So there wouldn't be any trace of you like you never goddamn existed. I don't think that's completely unreasonable to to proffer that. They don't do that, Kyle. Come on. <laughs> they don't do that. <laughs> oh, okay, very very good, very good. So so Jason, do you have anything you want to mention here before we move on to uh the next uh the next uh, topic of discussion? Uh no. No, let's 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 do this. Lots to cover. All right. All right, yeah, this is this is going to be an interesting one. We'll see how long this actually takes. Uh, uh, so, sifting the wheat from the chaff, the value of skepticism. Another one of Kyle's articles in the anthology. Uh, Kyle, what is skepticism? Well, briefly put, essentially, it's having a uh, questioning inquiry of the nature of the reality that you live in. It's not taking things at face value. It's it's having a almost a childlike curiosity and poking holes in things and seeing what's you know stable versus what's mythological and thus, you know, bleeds out in terms of its, you know, falseness. I guess that would be a, a working explanation of skepticism. Okay, very, very good. And uh, you mentioned poking holes, that'd be Occam's, but, but uh, what, what epistemological razors uh, can be used to uh, discover uh, the truth? Actually, that'd be Hitchens, I'm sorry. But yeah, what, what epistemological razors can be used to discover the truth? Well, the ones I used in my article um, are, are Occam's, Hitchens, and Hanlon's razors. So Occam's, of course, is... Uh, all, thing, all things being equal, the simplest explanation is presumably the best one or most accurate one. Hitchens is uh, that uh, the burden of proof it lays with the claim maker, the person making the claims. It does not require critics to provide evidence uh, substantiating their skepticism, essentially. Uh, putting the rocks in the wheelbarrow of the claim maker, to put it more uh, vernacularly. And then, of course, Hanlon is and this is actually very difficult for conspiracists because they violate this constantly. But Hanlon's essentially says never attribute malice to that which can be more accurately attributed to um, like incompetence. Okay. So that's that's kind of the long and short of it. And those are the three razors I've used to basically kind of looked over some patriot mythology and some other things. 
Okay, very, very good. And for for those of you who aren't keen on uh, on philosophy, epistem- epistemology is just the study uh, the study of the nature of nature of the nature and scope of knowledge. So, it's just how do, how do we know what we know essentially? So, uh, I guess uh, you mentioned Patriot mythology. What did you discover uh, using these epistemological razors uh, uh, about uh, the, these various claims being made uh, in the uh, Patriot community? Well, whether we're talking about corporate United States, whether we're talking constitutional sheriffs or state nullification or the oath breakers or the three inchers or whichever ones we're talking about, the main problem is that they all violate the, the epistemological razors in some way, shape or form pretty, pretty, uh, pretty constantly. And the relation to security culture more broadly is that if you are so gullible that you will not – accurately research something that you're looking at and you're not going to abide by real open source intelligence gathering, then when you are actually looking at real privacy issues like dragnet wiretapping and some other things, uh, you're going to fall for any old, you know, lie. Essentially, you're going to be conned. And unfortunately, it happens quite a bit. So I figured that a kind of non- exclusively privacy uh, focused, but in terms of really trying to encourage people to really just be skeptical. In fact, actually, some of the other security culture literature, some of the older stuff which you've got on the LUA site, mentions that you need to be skeptical as part of, I think it was Secured Record Archival specifically, which we'll get to shortly, uh, because there are social engineering hacks that some, some of the black hats use where they'll like call you up and pretend to be like salespeople or something else, and they'll trick people in terms of giving them passwords and even social security numbers and other such things. So being skeptical actually is really important to uh, security culture, absolutely. But yeah, oh, yeah patriot definitely. mythology. But patriot patriot mythology just undercuts skepticism. It makes you less secure, and it essentially just wastes your time. So it's it's really antithetical to privacy. Ultimately, is what I'm getting at. Yeah, yeah, and, and and I'll just mention this real real quickly. Uh, a lot of people don't really like philosophy much because it's like, well, philosophy doesn't matter. I mean, we're in the real world; like that's what matters, the the practical stuff. Uh, I I I really I really despise that. Uh, um, the first the first reason being uh, uh, without any uh, philosophical grounding, yet you just kind of blow with uh, you just kind of blow with the wind, uh, whatever is more convenient for you. And then also, I mean, uh, epistemology is a really really important thing. How do you come to know knowledge? Uh, what is justified belief? Uh, and especially when it comes when it comes to anything, essentially, or security culture, uh, as we're discussing tonight, uh, I think those things are uh, very important if you're going to come to uh, intellectually honest and 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 uh, I guess uh, relatively sure conclusions. Uh, so so yeah. With that said, let's let's go ahead and move forward. Uh, modeling threats and analyzing risk: a rebuttal against doom porn. So Kyle, uh, this is a fun one. Uh, what is what is doom porn? Well, doom porn are. It's sensationalized guesses about how Tiawaki would eventually occur. Uh, the Urban Dictionary more specifically defined doom porn as, quote, articles or videos online prevalently in the blogosphere that mainly talk about the collapse of either the financial world or the world in its entirety. People can develop a fascination or addiction reading this stuff, much like people who watch regular porn, close quote. So in other words, doom porn is applied conspiracism is what it actually is. Okay, very good, very good. And uh, this next question definitely has uh, something to do with security culture, uh, whether it's uh, uh, digital encryption or whether it's digital paper, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, How does one model threats and analyze risk? Well, in much the same way that I mentioned just a moment ago about skepticism, you really need to research and actually look at these purported threats and not just look at the news cycle, but I'm talking about like going back to like the original scholarly journals going back to the original textbooks, the original source material, and really understanding, you know, whether we're talking about, you know, earthquakes, or we're talking about uh, solar flares, or we're talking about uh, supposed immigrant invasions of one flavor or another, or whatever the threat is, like, really, really learn it, like, backwards and forwards, like the back of your hand, using the original materials. Um, that, that's pretty much how you model threats, uh, at least as a starting point, analyzing risk. Well, that, all that is just basically just calculating the probability that the threat will actually reach out and touch you. Um, as long as you know how to reduce fractions, which pretty much any grade school kid can do, uh, then you can pretty much analyze risk once you actually have something resembling actual numbers from actual scientists or people who actually are 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 
uh, fairly have specialized knowledge about these threats, uh, who are reliable sources, not uh, not people with best interest, uh, can actually tell you about, well, because of the rotation of the sun or, or whatever the phenomenon is in question, uh, something, the actual real chances of something happening is like one in like 50, 500,000, you know, or whatever the ratios are, right? Uh, that's pretty much how you do it. You, you really need to just do original research about a specific phenomenon, a specific threat, and then just do a little bit of math and bada bing, bada boom, you can figure out whether something's going to reach out and touch you or not. Very good. Very good. So uh, I guess uh, um, what's, what's, we won't do a couple this time just or, uh, as, as we had planned just because it's for the sake of time. But uh, what is uh, one example of doom porn and uh, what did you discover uh, about it? Well, I mean, it's these uh, electromagnetic pulse issues, whether we're talking about naturally occurring solar flares or we're talking about artificial, um, you know, uh, like EMP attacks. Um, it's, it's just, it's been completely overblown. People really don't understand it. And when I actually did the risk analysis on this, it was really just kind of, just really kind of pitiful how extremely low the, and, and the specific details in the article, I would encourage people who are interested, especially if they consider themselves preppers, to really look at what I discovered that, you know, like, sorry, guys, but coronal mass ejections are like a naturally occurring phenomenon, and it's not going to, like, you know, take down the power grid anytime soon. So everybody just, like, calm the hell down. Um, you know, I actually went to the actual scientists and their actual published reports. One of them was from National, like, it was National Academy's Laboratories. So I actually, I'm not going by news articles, okay? I'm going to the original sources. I can't stress that enough. And the, they're basically telling a completely different story from what you're seeing in the news cycle. So it's one more reason I don't like the news cycle, like I've said many times before when you've had me on, Shane, because the news cycle, they'll just, they'll just straight up lie to people. And they did so too. So when a lot of preppers became preppers because they were concerned about solar flares or EMP attacks, a lot of that was just flat-out lies, and it's also another reason why I don't like that stupid prepper novel called One Second After, because it's all based on lies. I mean, my God, Newt Gingrich wrote the foreword. Hey, look, if his name is on anything, you know it's a piece of crap. Okay, this is Mr. Contract with America for people who know his background as a politician. So, you know, when, when, you know, when, when old Stefan Molyneux mentioned about politicians, they lie, they lie, they lie. And you know what? They lied on this one, too. You know, Chances are we're not going to die any time in our lifetime or have a downed electrical grid or whatever the hell because of solar flares, okay? Generally speaking, the, the probability is so ridiculously low it's not even an issue. I would rather worry about like fractional reserve lending or central banking or stuff that can actually reach out and touch you if you're going to prioritize threats and so forth, but not solar flares. Come on, grow up. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Uh, I wanted to mention this is probably going to turn into another three-hour doozy. Uh, so, Jason, I know you have to. I know you have work tonight. Are, are you good? <laughs> it's it's going to be a three-hour show. Yeah, uh, it's, 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 we, we still got a whole other section to get through, man. Oh, it's oh, going to oh. be. Yeah, this is just uh, we're halfway through section two. We've got to get through section three and the conclusion. Um, but I just wanted to check in with you and make sure you're make sure you're good. Uh, yeah. Um. That would, yeah, what, you, that would put you two hours late to work, wouldn't it? Yeah, that'd probably put me two hours late to work. I'll <laughs> stay as I'll stay into the chat as as long as I can. All right, uh, yeah, and, and, and I understand if yeah, I understand if you have to go. Yeah, you gotta gotta keep your job. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, yeah. All right. Good. Ky day. Kyle. Um, yes. What about the What about the zombie apocalypse? Oh come now on! That's, now that's serious. <laughs> no, I'm <laughs> I'm kidding. No, I've I've had these. I've, I've seriously had these conversations, you know, uh, me being a recovery, a recovering conspiracy theorist. Uh, I still do enjoy uh, uh, some good doom porn every once in a while. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not as much <laughs> – I'm not like uh, – I don't know. They really don't have me sold. And it seems like um, I had a coworker and um, I kind of showed him some things, you know, like got him questioning – you know, just basically a lot of lies that are being told in the mainstream. And, you know, six months later, he's convincing me that, you know, this summer's the end. And, uh, you know, I kind of chuckle about it because I've been down that road. I don't know how many times, you know, I'm, I'm yeah, hey, this no, seriously, this year is is really the time it's going to hit, Kyle. 
You know, it wasn't mm-hmm. last year. It wasn't the year before or the year before that or however long you've been looking into this shit, you know. Um, but anyway, I, I, yeah, I, and I, the projected and the projected collision of Nibiru with Earth was supposed to happen last September 23rd, but I think we're all still here, right? Right. Yeah. 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 Well, How many we? times? <laughs> <laughs> so. Okay. Good deal. Good deal. Uh, so I guess just uh, 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 one. We'll do one more question from this section. Uh, what are, What are the kinds of questions someone should ask themselves if they are in a genuine shit is his shit is a fan scenario? Well, uh, in terms of like more real life, not doom porn, but but like real life, because I do think there is value in survivalism. I do think there is in value in like off grid homesteading and, and similar things. You know, ask yourselves this: like, would you have anyone to turn to for help? You know, are you capable of living on the street, if only temporarily, like during an emergency? Um, Could you survive the climate outside without electricity where you live for a week or even a weekend? And if not, could you travel to another part of the country where you can? You know, have you got an alternate place to sleep, whether that be a travel trailer, a van, a cave, a tent, or frankly, anywhere at all, even if it's just out under the stars? You know, I mean, how can you communicate if your computer has been seized? You know, could the government police easily read the data on your hard drive? Would you have access to your backup files that are presumably in a different place that's, you know, securely hidden? I guess the last major question would be if you have uh, children or elderly family living with you, would you be able to feed, clothe, and provide uh, medical care for your dependents? So those are, I would suggest, some some of the real questions when you have an actual, provable, real emergency, whether if it's a shorter or longer uh, length, is that there are there is an issue of what is your lifestyle going to be for the foreseeable future, in terms of like especially if it's like a grid down situation. So there are things I think people really need to ask themselves, at least in terms of like mental preparedness, uh, more so than not. But I would really stress that. Doom porn is not healthy, man. I mean, even even in terms of entertainment, uh, you know, I would suggest that if people want entertainment options, there's all sorts of other, you know, options that are available. Hell, there's Netflix, right? Just just to name one. But, you know, in, in terms of like, I'm going to be, I'm going to go prepping, you know, worrying about, you know, the Muslims imposing Sharia law or something <laughs> kind of really seems really more evocative of cartoon politics than anything else. <laughs> Well, you didn't provide your proper trigger warning there, Kyle, but I'll, I'll let it slide this time. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, okay, good good deal, good deal. So let's move forward to the next one, The Libertarian Case for Judicial Transparency, which was an article uh, Kyle and I co-authored, a uh, very, very important one uh, in, in my opinion. I'm sure Kyle feels that way as well. But uh, I'll, 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 have, I'll leave this question for you, and then I'll, I'll cover the second one. So uh, what is judicial transparency? Well, essentially it's being able to like read the court documents. Uh, you know, a lot of people may not know this, but actually, uh, sometimes it can be rather difficult to get access to public records, like, uh, especially if it's like criminal cases. Uh, and that goes double and triple if what the defendant is being accused of is a victimless crime. So the, the idea behind judicial transparency is using the alternative media to basically gain access to public records and then making it available to the public uh, such as like uploading PDF, uh, PDF files up on websites and then, you know, make, you know, like, like for, like for specific cases and then, you know, kind of promoting it in the sense of, oh, do you want to learn about this particular political prisoner? Well, here's all his, you know, most important court documents, you know, here's the, uh, the search warrants and the indictments and the, uh, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> different motions, motions, right? A lot of motions, motion to do this, motion to suppress evidence, motion, motion, motion. Right. So, so, so that we can actually know what's going on in these, because remember court case, courses are, you know, <laughs> supposed to be speedy public, you know, jury trials. Right. Uh, so it's kind of hard to have a public mm-hmm. trial if you don't even know what's happening. And, you know, it's kind of unreasonable to expect people to like travel physically to a courthouse, get screened and so forth. Um, when, when in fact you can kind of keep tabs on a case if you just simply had access to the documents, which thanks to the internet, you can now go click, click, click. But unfortunately, government likes to, uh, at least some of the American governments, because sometimes, depending on which one you're dealing with, sometimes they have a paywall, and other times 
they make it available for free PDF download themselves. So it's kind of this weird uh, situation where sometimes the public documents are available, but other times the public documents have to be paid for. Oh yeah, oh yeah, they definitely do. Uh, Pacer, all those, uh, all those fun things. Pacer, and then there's, uh, um, there's one other one where I was looking for court documents once. They wanted you to pay like two hundred dollars a month for access to this document, and I said no, no, I'm not going to do that. Yeah, that, and these it's, are it's a site designed for lawyers, but I, I, I guess I understand that. But still, like the company that has the website, man, are they making a killing? Yeah, and 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 again, there. And remember, this is all you know via, uh, through the monopoly power of Leviathan, right? I mean, this is not like free market at all. So the fact you even have to pay for the public records is really just kind of kooky in and of itself. And that also also goes double and triple for things like like transcripts, right? The court transcripts of certain like uh, sessions, like what the stenographer would put together. Uh, you got to pay for those too, apparently, uh, or at least a oh, lot yeah. of the time. So you know, it's just. What actually happened in these courtrooms? Because we don't actually know what happened. They might as well be de facto star chambers, quite frankly. Yeah, yeah. And, and obviously I understand that uh, like, like if there were still paper files and they had to mail them to you, I understand if there'd be like a $5 fee or something, like, you know, covering like the ink and the paper. But it's all digital now. It mm-hmm. costs them nothing. It costs them nothing to upload those documents. So the, so the fact that you have to pay for them is just r- really ridiculous, uh, in my opinion. But, uh, but yeah. So, so why why is judicial transparency important? Well, uh, obviously, like, well, like, let's say uh, your uh, I don't know your friend gets locked up for activism or what, like, for whatever c- circumstance. Uh, you want to be able to know what the government is saying, right? You have to you have to know what they're saying in order to mount a defense. So if you don't have access to those court documents. You, you, you aren't going to know what to do, essentially. Uh, additionally, uh, like uh, with the political prisoners, like the, we'll say the Citizens for Constitutional Freedom, like from their court documents, I've learned what not to do. And uh, anyone that, that takes a gander through the hundreds and hundreds of documents on there, uh, if, they, if, they, if they read them or skim them or whatever, um, they'll say, huh. You know, I probably shouldn't do this if I want to if I want to retain any of the the remaining freedoms that I have left. Uh, so it, it's, it's knowing what the government is saying, and then also, I mean, you want to prevent it from happening again. You want to be proactive, not reactive. So uh, there's also uh, one other one other aspect too. Uh, if the government is is breaking their own laws, which they do all the time, uh, you, you got to be able to prove it, and you do that through the court documents. And Gary Hunt's done this for for quite a while, and he's he's brought some of this stuff to light. So you have to have the court documents to do that. Uh, so that's that's why it is important. Uh, as far as how do you do it, just go look at the Liberty Intertech website, uh, tinyurl.com forward slash political prisoners LUA. Again, tinyurl.com forward slash political prisoners LUA. It's a great model. Just go, I mean, obviously you can adapt it to, to, to whatever, but it works. It works. Uh, you do like 160707 uh, year, month, and day. And uh, then you just put the name of the court document, United States versus Skylar Barbeau, for example. It's really easy to do. I recommend a lot more people in the alternative media actually caring about judicial transparency. It's really frustrating uh, that they'll they'll write about the – like you go on – even mainstream media does this too. But the alternative media should be better about this. They should be better. Uh, They they discuss a case and they're like the court – here's an excerpt from the court document. It's like really? You're going to put an excerpt from the court document, but you aren't going to make it available so people can actually like read the entire thing. It's really, really lazy. Yeah, it uh, is. So, and it reminds yeah. me exactly what Ammon Bundy did prior to the status turf war back in January of this year, God. where he got in front and he said, yeah, remember the stack of court documents? And, and then he's like, I've got the court documents here. And the only thing I could think of is, okay, so what he's really telling you know the audience and, and everybody watching is, I've got the court documents, but you can't look at them. Because I mean, the yep. doc, I mean, the, the the camera that was looking at him was so far away, and even when he, I think he may have flipped it at one point, so where you could see a little bit of it, but you can't read it because the camera was too far away. So the point is, I've got the documents, but you can't look at it. That that's that's not judicial transparency, not by a long shot. You know, if if, if the if the common man on the street can't read it, then it's not being transparent by definition. So why the hell are the are some of these guys, uh, you know, some of our competition, to be sure. Uh, why are they bragging that I've got the court documents, all 20,000 of them for this one particular political prisoner, but I'm totally going to brag about it, yet not actually make it available to the audience. That, I think, has got some serious intellectual dishonesty for so many reasons. That would probably take up another episode easily. Yeah, 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 that is true. But I'll say it one more time. 
please please help those of you in the alternative media do this tinyurl.com forward slash political prisoners LUA or just go to libertyintertag.com. There's a whole political prisoners archive. There's like 20, nearly 20 archives for the citizens for constitutional freedom. And then I don't know, 10 other cases. Uh, so yeah, please, please, please start doing this. Well, please start doing this. Uh, so let's go ahead and move forward. Se- secured record archival, how to protect your documents from the government. Um, so Kyle, what is secured record archival? Well, briefly defined, secured record archival is the disciplined practice of organizing, locking, and hiding both your digital and paper records. Does the Fourth Amendment protect your documents and records? Well, this is rather fascinating. The shorter explanation is a qualified yes. Um, It's not as hopeless as the cell phones, but it's still not a good situation. Uh, Just for purposes of time, I'll, I'll try and keep this really short. Here's where the issue is. What counts as papers under the Fourth Amendment? That's kind of what a lot of this is centering on. And unfortunately, whether it's Orrin Kerr's 2005 white paper or, or some other people, nobody really wants to answer this question. And I even had a hard time really trying to get a firm answer on what counts as papers under the Fourth Amendment, even from the judges. So, you know, Orrin Kerr, he mentioned about, well, we have to distinguish between physical and digital searches in the search warrants. But, of course, that doesn't answer anything involving the Chimel rule which basically is uh, search as incident to lawful arrest. In short, anything on your physical person, once you are arrested, is subject to search without a warrant. And, it, and your lawyer, when you're, back, when you're later in court, um, cannot file a motion to suppress uh, evidence based on the exclusionary rule, which, and that exclusionary rule is what actually enforces the Fourth Amendment, by the way. So exclusionary rules rather used to be important, but unfortunately it's been rendered impotent because... Much like Social Security, where the rule is, or the rule, like I said earlier, the rule is that Social Security is voluntary. Well, the Fourth Amendment rule is um, the people have the right to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects. Okay. The only exception is a search warrant that describes particularly the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Uh, the problem is that that the exception is now grown and grown and grown, and there's now 20,000 different exceptions, how people can go to the Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution Wikipedia article, and there's this whole long section on the exceptions to the warrant requirements. So the exceptions to the rule of the people have the right to be secure in their own papers is, 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 we might as well be talking about the voluntariness of Social Security. Like, yeah, legally it is the rule, but the exceptions are so broad that the rule is almost, is really kind of inconsequential, practically. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's a very gonna, similar effect. And, and I will say, looking through all of these court documents, I don't read every single one of them. I skim, I skim through, but I will say, I'll say like 95% of the documents I read where there's like motion to suppress evidence, like it's most always just denied. And it's, it's like, it, and, and the reason is just kind of, but the reason is simply just like, well, we can do that. We want, we can do that if we want to. Like, yeah, yeah. You know, we go piss on a log. Uh, is essentially kind of the the uh, I guess the the feel that I get from reading those documents. But uh, so so you you mentioned uh, secured record archival. Uh, how do you do it? Well, there's I think I was able to kind of break it down into like five steps, where essentially you scan, inventory, backup, encrypt or lock, and cache. So just very briefly put, for purposes of time, uh, scan would involve. Uh, not just uh, antivirus and anti-malware programs for, like, your computer records, but also the digitization of paper records uh, because, you know, converting the paper into into digital. Uh, Inventory determines just how much and what kind of records uh, there actually are with the goal of being able to reduce extraneous clutter, whether that clutter is, you know, physically in terms of, like, a filing cabinet or something like that, or digitally in terms of a hard drive. So, you know, and again, the article goes quite into detail about some ways I suggest about how to do this in terms of like sorting the paperwork, both digital and paper, and and how to do it. Uh, Backup would be uh, kind of spreading out. uh, Some people call this redundancy. Uh, The other alternative media content producers I know uh, would call this redundancy where you kind of spread out all of your hopefully inventoried and organized records among dissimilar storage media. So like burning it onto CDs or burning it onto DVDs, putting it onto multiple flash drives, 
uh, uh, you know, putting your data, doing like a full disk backup, if at all possible, or even an incremental hard disk backup onto like an external hard disk or something like that. Uh, so that in case there is like a computer failure, you can still access your data via an identical copy. Uh, encrypt or lock uh, is basically a way of trying to prevent like casual theft. Uh, in, or in a sense, so like if you have, so, or let me put it this way, even if your information was stolen, if you encrypt the digital or let's say lock the physical, uh, it would be kind of hard for somebody to actually benefit from the information on that record. So again, like again, like with PGP, if you encrypted your emails, um, it's kind of hard for somebody doing a man in the middle attack to actually read it. Or as in the case with using like file encryption, if somebody stole your hard drive or cloned it and copied everything, even if they were able to do that, if you encrypted it, you know, you know, they were going to have one hell of a tough time uh, decrypting it or hacking it, I should say. Uh, and then with your paper records, if you lock them like in like in an actual locked container, um, you know, unless they can figure out some way of using either brute force or picking a lock or something like that, depending on the type of lock you use. Uh, because combination locks are not that good. I do recommend people use physical, like actual, like physical keys, key type of padlocks, which are, which are less likely of being hacked, or I should say pick locked, uh, or, or let me say bypassing, because that's the problem with combination padlocks is that you can actually use a thin sheet of metal to actually mess around with the mechanism and pop the lock really easily. Like, like we're talking seconds here if you do it right. <laughs> Uh, and then finally, cache is basically the the last layer of the fifth layer of security. Or yeah, actually, it's the second layer of security actually that applies equally to both digital and paper. And the idea here is to hide the records. So again, whether we're talking digital or paper records, you hide the burnable disks uh, that are in that are you know whatever that are whatever, uh, preferably with the encrypted files on it. And then for paper records, once you have it in the storage container, presumably that's been padlocked, presumably, then maybe you should, like, go bury it somewhere, much like you would, much like how preppers bury, like, PVC pipes, which are their supply caches. You would do the same thing with your records, even your paper records. So that's kind of really the really abbreviated short way of, of describing how to perform secured record archival, but I would suggest people really read the article for more detail because there is a lot of detail regarding secured record archival um, I think some people may be not knowledgeable with some elements of it, but it's the really comprehensive view that I think is rather important. And and do keep in mind um, because the uh, <laughs> because the application of the exclusionary rule is rather paltry. You know, if you get even if you get a search warrant, uh, you know, uh, being used against you. Those search warrants have such overbroad language that they just grab everything. They grab modems, they grab hard drives, they just grab, 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 and even your paper records too. So if you were to hide a lot of that stuff and encrypt or lock it, like, and preferably do it like off-site, if at all possible, in a place where you can still access it, then I think that will mitigate a lot of damage, even if you were the subject of a police raid, for example. Okay, good deal, good deal. So uh, next article, keeping your own counsel. Uh, so, I mean, this is the section, information security. What is it? What is information security? Well, information security is, is the more accurate term. Uh, you know, shortened down uh, as the military, military abbreviations go, it's InfoSec. But that's what, that's what it is. It's information security. Information security essentially is how do you protect data or more generally, how do you protect knowledge? Because there are certain things you really have no business knowing. Just to use as an example, just for educational purposes tonight, um, if I went around telling everybody uh, my individual preferences regarding asparagus, I tell you I love asparagus, or alternatively, I told you I hate asparagus, okay? Now that I've told you my preferences one way or another regarding asparagus, you now know my preferences about asparagus, but then again, why the hell am I telling you about my preferences regarding asparagus or much of anything else? So the idea behind information security is that there are certain things you don't talk about uh, at the very least. Some certain things you, you know, private conversations need to be kept private. There are certain things that you should never talk about publicly. And even in terms of private conversations, there are some things that you shouldn't talk about with certain people. And then other things, of course, there should, should be a degree of allowance. So, for example, if somebody tells you, hey, buddy, I'm going to tell you something in confidence, you are expected to, to keep confidences. 
Because otherwise, if you're just going to go blab, then uh, you know, then you aren't going to be uh, told anybody's. Um, I guess I shouldn't say secrets, but I can't think of a better word right offhand. But if somebody's going to tell you secrets, you need to be able to, you know, mum's the word, my friend. So yeah, private conversations need to remain private. And um, yeah, so uh, the, I mean, the idea is to respect someone's privacy. So if someone were to tell you like, hey, you know, there's something I'd like to get your advice on, but please don't tell anybody else, you are honor bound to respect that. And if you don't, you are violating information security. And the reason why that's significant, Shane, is that if you can't keep your trap shut, if you can't keep confidences, then you are violating someone else's individual privacy, which also means that if you aren't willing to keep someone else's privacy when they entrust you with knowledge or data, that is confidential, then why should anybody give a shit about your privacy when you want things being communicated confidentially? So yeah. in other words, so in other words, security culture in large part is foundationally and even philosophically rooted to some degree, not just in privacy, but more specifically in information security. So a lot of these other uh, topics that have been mentioned more in passing uh, in a lot of ways, a lot of it focuses really on information security. So if you can't keep your trap shut uh, when you really need to, or uh, per perhaps a little bit better way of saying it, shutting the fuck up, then, uh, yeah, you don't give a crap about privacy. You really don't. So, yes, there is a place and time for free speech, and there is a good role for uh, the alternative media, and, well, the free press more generally, freedom of the press and all that. But there are some things that do need to be kept private. There are some things that are not for public consumption that are not to be held up to public scrutiny. So when you hear people, and really just a very quick example, one problem I have with sex bloggers is because they'll just like, like dirty laundry is aired out. And to some degree it's understandable, right? Because they're sex bloggers. So of course you're going to have like some of these bloggers mention things like so-and-so I slept with, or there's that one really famous blogger who just sleeps, is very promiscuous and sleeps around with like every frat boy at Yale or where, whatever, some Ivy League school that she were, uh, attends. So yeah, but imagine she doesn't give about, give a shit. I don't remember her handle right offhand, but she doesn't give a shit about privacy. Like she'll like names, dates, places and stuff. So, you know, I, I think you can kind of understand that the discretion is actually very much entwined with privacy as well as security culture. Okay, very, very good. Uh, so uh, I guess I'll skip that next one. Um, why is recklessly filling in, filling in application forms a violation of your privacy? Because you're flapping your gums, albeit in a more written form, but you're just flapping your gums telling some stranger or bureaucrat – uh, knowledge that they have no business knowing. That really, of all intents and purposes, should be kept confidential. I mean, hell, there was um, there was one particular individual, don't remember his name right offhand, who basically suggested something like the burger flipper test. Like, okay, like like you're at a fast food uh, joint, right? And, you, you know, the guy's asking you, okay, how do you want your meat cooked and all that? And, um, and oh, by the way, how much money do you make? And where do you live? And what was your, what's your favorite sexual position? None of those questions really pass the burger flipper test. It's none of his goddamn business. And I would suggest that with a lot of these applications for whatever, getting a bank account or getting a job or some other stuff, it's getting almost into the area of like psychological analysis and some really kind of invasive things. Like, were you ever spanked as a child? Uh, as some uh, people might recognize that, that little in-joke reference. <laughs> so some things get kind of really kind of invasive. And again, if, if it's private conversations, that's one thing. Uh, but if we're talking about things that are going on the record, whether we're talking about uh, media, publicly available knowledge, or we're talking even things like applications where you're just, you know, just kind of just reflexively just answering all sorts of things and, uh, you know, how, how much did you pay in taxes last year and so forth, then you really don't then, – then by your own actions, you don't care about privacy, not even your own. Yeah. Yeah, that, that that's true. And what came to mind uh, when we were putting this together was, I mean, applications. I mean, I, I'm I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm filling out job applications, and it sucks. Yeah, it sucks, and I know it's a violation of my privacy. But I mean, what the hell are you gonna do? I mean, you 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 can't bypass the application unless you you can't bypass like uh, that person identifiable information. You you just can't. Um, so I, I don't know. I. I <clears throat> 
I, I, I definitely think uh, if you if you aren't required to fill out these fill out some of these applications, I think it's probably best to bypass them. But uh, unfortunately, in today's society, uh, yeah, privacy is not really treasured like it should be. Now, like if if you're if you're in the bathroom or something, like people people respect privacy there. But uh, I was like that quote you put in there. That's why we have blinds, and that's why we have uh, um, doors to bathrooms. It's because we respect privacy. But once we get outside of that realm, when it comes to all of our personal identifiable, identifiable information, uh, people just don't really care anymore, uh, or or they don't, or they might, but they don't take the steps necessary in actually preserving their privacy. Yeah, and unfortunately, that kind of seems to be the case. And regarding the job application question in particular, I think that actually, if anything, can be turned around to kind of bolster up the notion of financial independence, which I know is part of the direct action series. I think you had Jake DeSellis on to cover that. So, you know, if, if you want to kind of maybe not in the short term, but more of a long term thing, kind of try to avoid that as much as possible. I think something is to be said for financially independent early retirement. But again, that's a topic for another time. Okay, very good. So let's get to section three. Jeez, yeah, we're Jesus. Uh, nine, uh, 20 minutes over the scheduled time. We just got to section three. Uh, so yeah, overdrive is an understatement. But uh, section three, low profile behavior. Uh, this article, chilling dissent: How government demonizes Americans. Uh, I recommend you go check out the profiling archive available at the Liberty Intertech website, tinyurl.com forward slash lua profiling, or you can just go to the website libertyintertech.com and just. Uh, go to the drop down tab for profiling you can find all that stuff there so uh this is kind of a it's a it seems like a self-answering question but does the government demonize its own citizens yes and the war on terror so-called that george w bush started really exacerbated this demonization especially of americans of a broad arabic ancestry very yeah that's 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 definitely uh that's definitely true uh, all right, this one will this one will be fun. Uh, what is uh, actually? Let me preface it with this: uh, If you look at uh, the profiling archive, a lot of it is geared around just extremism. Uh, so let's, let's let's talk about that a little bit. What is extremism? Well, which definition are we using? Uh, this was actually kind of something that took me quite a while to discover any sort of formal uh, definition from the government, whether legally or otherwise. But basically, I think probably the one definition I'll go with for tonight was probably the most definitive. And thankfully, it seems to be in our favor, which just seems a little odd. But basically, there was a joint intelligence bulletin by DHS and FBI that was issued on March – or excuse me, April 16th of uh, last year, 2015, where they said domestic extreme extremism – uh, defined is uh, basically uh, individuals present in the United States who seek to further political or social goals wholly or in part through unlawful acts of force or violence. However, the mere advocacy of political or social positions, political activism, the use of strong rhetoric or generalized philosophic embrace of violent tactics may not constitute extremism and may be constitutionally protected, close quote. Now, think about that. That's FBI and DHS talking. So, yeah, uh, I, I guess those of us in the alternative media are not extremists, according to the government's own newest definition from what I was able to find. We are not extremists because we're not actually uh, using uh, the means of guerrilla warfare uh, to, to go conduct uh, some sort of uh, clandestine operations. Because uh, even somebody like Chris Cantwell, again, use of strong rhetoric, generalized philosophic embrace of violent tactics may not constitute extremism. So I guess if Chris Cantwell is A-OK -okay and is not an extremist, I guess that means the rest of us who aren't as um, colorful as he is, uh, I, guess, I guess the rest of us are in the clear, I suppose. Uh, but yeah, let's move forward to, uh, um, to uh, Bruce Schneider's model. Um, what's, uh, what, what is that about? Well, basically, he had a TED talk a while back where he and, and the details about this are, are in the articles. Uh, he basically had this, mo uh, this, this, this model where you have this trifecta of feelings, theory and reality. So people have their uh, and this is about security. So people have their feelings about security. They have their theoret theoretical conceptions of security. And then there's the reality of security. And what he suggested is that basically security theater is all about your feelings of security. Which is just stupid uh, for a lot of reasons, just don't have time for it to get into tonight. The idea behind security culture, though, 
was to bring your feelings and your theories of security in line with the actual objective reality of security. So that's what Schneider was getting at. Okay, very, very good. Well, we'll, we'll plow forward. Uh, fanciful notices. Should you post a warning sign on your property? Uh, so I guess, I guess first off, like, like what, is it, what does this mean? What are, what are people actually trying out there? Well, they, there's kind of this notion that, uh, and in a lot of ways, this almost reminds me of the earlier mention, like overloading the NSA servers with, with email keywords. Uh, it's kind of similar here where the idea is that, well, if you just put together like a custom aluminum warning signage and you invest in that and you put it on like the gate to your property or the front door to your home, then uh, for some reason telling the government agents what the constitutional limits are on their powers somehow will make them think twice of like raiding the place and maybe instead of SWAT teaming the place, they'll like wear suits and knock on your door and just politely hand you the search warrant uh, or, or at least be more congenial. That's, that's, that's kind of uh, the whole making them think twice thing. Uh, when, of course, um, the actual case law that I looked at regarding the warning signage, basically the short version is that the judges essentially said, uh, yeah, guys, um, the cops avoiding or otherwise ignoring the warning signs does not therefore mean the Fourth Amendment was being violated. Uh, there's more details in the article, but suffice to say, and I think the listeners can kind of see a pattern here, whether we're talking cell phones or your documents and records, or as is the case here with the warning signage, uh, the Fourth Amendment isn't exactly this legal interstice you can fall on that will therefore keep you out of prison automatically. It's really been kind of chopped down so much, it's, it's not even funny. So as a privacy tool, as a legal interstice, yeah, putting, putting the Fourth Amendment on a, on a, on a warning sign is not going to keep you out of jail by itself, you know, just say. Yeah. Yep, definitely, definitely. And uh, I'd like to just repeat this again. We're, we're crunching down to a couple hundred pages and eight hours of audiobook into hopefully three hours. Uh, so if I, we're, we're, yeah, we're moving past these pretty quickly, but definitely check out the articles in the anthology and audiobook. Let's go to tinyurl.com forward slash security culture guide. Again, tinyurl.com forward slash security culture guide. Uh, the next one is uh, how to role play police interrogations. And we covered this uh, subject in a segment on the October 18th edition of LUA Radio. Just go check that out. You can find Kyle's article uh, in the anthology. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we're just kind of move past that one. It's, it's, it's very, very important, but we've covered, we've talked about it numerous times on the show. So, uh, yeah, we'll just move past it. Uh, blending in the art of the gray man is the next one. Uh, Kyle, what is, uh, what is the gray man? Well, the gray man is essentially a way of – it was defined as a man who can blend to any scene or situation without standing out and hiding his uh, skills and qualities. And in the article, I, I, I cited or linked to a image of what some people have referred to as the gray duck. Essentially, that's, that's what you're trying to kind of emulate as a duck where above the surface you seem calm and serene and peaceful and otherwise blending into the environment, but underneath, or shall I say just below the surface uh, of, of that water, you are paddling like hell and you are actively doing stuff. When, and of course what a duck does is actively paddling just below the surface. So the gray duck, or just ducks in general, is, is kind of the imagery here of, of what the gray man is. So yes, you are, you do have situational awareness. You are, you know, being very cognizant of your environment. Uh, usually, uh, you're, you're also practicing everyday carry, uh, as well. Uh, but the point is that you're just, you're just to the outside, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> mainstream public, you are Mr. Nobody special. And that's exactly how you want to be. Okay. Good deal, good deal, and you described the the characteristics there. Um, so uh, this next question: Why why are appearance and behavior distinct uh, yet equally important characteristics? Being a gray man. Okay, so appearance is basically just like physically how you look, right? I mean, do you have long hippie hair, or is it nice and short, uh, short, you know, nice and cropped? Um, do you have a lot of piercings or not? Do you have a lot of tattoos or not? Uh, do you have like kind of stereotypical middle class bourgeois type clothing, or are you wearing something kind of freaky punk rock almost, uh, you know, skateboard type clothing, or or, or something else, right? Um, 
that's that's what appearance is. Behavior would be, you know, are you skittish or are you calm or are you angry or are you, you know, walking quickly or do you act lazy? Um, that that's kind of what, what what's kind of going on in here. In terms of the difference between the two, um, the gray man is really a combination of appearance and behavior. So if your physical appearance is something that blends into the social environment, then that combined with your behavior actually can help you is, is what's essential for blending in. So in other words, if you're like in suburbia, the last thing you want to do if you want to be the gray man is essentially wear have like a mohawk with multiple piercings and like, you know, uh, a choker. And then, you know, looking at everybody like, like you want to be the man and kind of like swagging with your shoulders or your hips or something, whatever that swagger that some jocks do. That's like the last thing you want to do. And by similar token, um, well, let me put it this way. If you want to be a better gray man, if the context is more like, like a professional setting, obviously you would want to wear something like a suit or, or some like formal dress for women uh, that's appropriate to the office. And, and, you know, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to be skittish, right? You want to be calm and collected and dare, shall I say, professional, if, if that's the environment you're blending into. So that's the idea. The idea is to be the gray duck. Definitely, definitely. And I remember uh, um, listening to a, listening to a, a guy talk one time, and uh, uh, and, and he, he was a metalhead. So he would, uh, I mean, it's it's uh, uh, life's life's a stage. So like, and, and he acted as a gray man in this situation. He would go go. He would he would uh, practice with his metal band and have like one persona. And then he would go to like a professional business setting and, and adapt to that to, to that situation. Uh, which uh, yeah, it's 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 not it's it's not too hard to do. And I do want to mention. I wouldn't start with this as practice, but uh, um, if you're already kind of exercising the gray man, um, which I, I, I do in high level indoctrination and all of that stuff, uh, political field trips are a great way uh, to practice the gray man. Um, obviously, don't get yourself arrested by any stretch of the imagination. Go read the, the tutorial Kyle wrote. Uh, I think it's tinyurl.com forward slash political field trips. But yeah, I mean that, that's a that's a, a great way to uh, exercise the gray man, and uh, I guess get get two birds stoned at once, as Rick <laughs> boys would say. But uh, uh, but yeah, any any closing thoughts on that one? Yeah, uh, Mr. Producer kind of just mentioned something. Yeah, he said, "Don't be a goose in a circle of ducks." And yes, that's absolutely correct. The idea when you're being when you're consciously choosing to be the gray man is you do not want to stand out. So for people, especially for people who uh, imagine themselves to be preppers or whatever, I mean, yeah, there is open carry, and I very much uh, am in favor of open carry, for example. Uh, that's getting into a different, different subject for another time. But suffice it to say for now, the one problem with open carry, and the one thing I will acquiesce to the concealed carriers on, is that open carry is not conducive to being the gray man unless – you're in a type of environment where you're pretty much surrounded by people who are also similarly openly carrying. But unfortunately, the mass population, even right here in Texas, do not open carry uh, as a normal cultural practice. And also, being the gray man, you have to be cognizant of social custom, of cultural norms, and you want to follow those to the letter when you're being the gray man. Because if you violate that, any of that stuff, no, it's not something they can slap the cuffs on and throw you in the paddy wagon over, but it will draw undue attention to you. So if you're trying not to draw undue attention, you've got to follow social norms and you've got to follow uh, you know, cultural uh, habits. Definitely, definitely. Uh, and uh, you know, one thing that gray men do, they drive inconspicuous cars. So uh, mm -hmm. how to make your car inconspicuous? Uh, definitely an important one and one I see violations of on a daily basis. But uh, what are some characteristics? Uh, actually, we'll, we'll uh, actually no, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll do it in order here. What, what are the characteristics of an inconspicuous car? Well, generally speaking, it's uh, an inconspicuous car is one. Uh, well, very similar to being the gray man, one that doesn't stand out in the immediate social environment. Uh, you know, depending where you are, this may take the form of like a four door sedan, or uh, maybe in more suburban areas, maybe a non-luxury SUV or, or whatever. Uh, pickup trucks pretty much work just about everywhere, um, except maybe the parking lot of a uh, nice uh, corporate office, more of an upscale one. But, but you know, 
the characteristics can pretty much just be anything. The point is that it doesn't stand out. So generally speaking, try to stay away from like the red Ferraris and, and you know, Lamborghinis and stuff like that. But, you know, most people won't have a problem avoiding those because they're kind of unaffordable <laughs> anyway for most people. Uh, but yeah, the idea is that the inconspicuous car is basically just applying the gray man, but to your car is really what's going on there. Yeah, yeah. So, so essentially, it's like uh, I mean, the car, like the like the car, like a, just an, like a uh, relatively old, um, I don't know, like a, a gray nondescript vehicle. Like people don't even notice you on the road. That's that, that's most ideal. Kind, kind of like well, kind of like we'll just use one example. Kind of like a Dodge Neon, right? Like like that car is so common. Or really, any pickup truck like a Ford F one fifty is just so common, and not just in Texas either. For the Ford F one hundred and fifty, because there's been jokes about Texans and their pickup trucks, but <laughs> um, but yeah, like 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 a lot of pickup trucks, especially the Ford F one hundred and fifties, are so common. It's like Dodge Neons, like like you can like pretty much blow past, and it's not a big deal. But again, that's the appearance. The behavior would be things like, uh, and no, I'm not justifying victimless crimes here, but things like not speeding. Uh, although in some cases, arguably, there could be, be an argument made that you're more likely to speed and get away with it if you are not driving the, uh, you know, the Dodge Viper, for example, if you were in a Dodge Neon instead. So the argument could be made the other way. But again, you know, not doing crazy lane changes, not sudden, you know, uh, screeching stops and, you know, gunning, you know, gunning the ex- racing, the accelerator and stuff like that. So the inconspicuous car is also the behavior of the driver as well. So if you, if you ever notice when next time you're out in public guys, I mean, I mean, look at some of the traffic, uh, the behavior too, of some of these drivers. If you're, I would suggest that your eyes are really drawn to the drivers who are either driving quickly or probably more accurately driving erratically. And of course, if it draws your eye, you're damn, you better be damn straight. It's probably going to also draw the eye of uh, the nearest patrol officer, if you know what I mean. Yeah, so. definitely, definitely. And just one note on the like, uh, you, you've got to like adapt to the social customs and, and the social norms and stuff. If you're going the speed limits uh, on, uh, I don't know, like the interstate near Chicago or whatever it's called, the freeway, whatever it is, you're going to draw some freaking attention. Everyone there drives 10 or 50 miles per hour for the speed limit. Uh, which I don't like doing because I don't like getting fined and getting it put in police encounters. But, uh, I mean, people haul ass, and most everyone goes over the speed limit. So you, you kind of, like, again, you have to kind of adapt to uh, the, the, the scenario you're in. Uh, but, yeah, well, so, so what are some things to avoid uh, if you want your car to be inconspicuous? Take off the goddamn Ron Paul bumper stickers. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, like most of our audience are basically libertarian, so I think they can kind of get that point. But even for people who are more like hippies or just just other folks, take off the damn bumper stickers, please. I mean, let me put it this way. You're in traffic. You're, you're, you're traveling on the roads. OK, now there's people who don't have bumper stickers. And let's say somebody's passing you on your, you know, in the in the in the lane to the left of you. And he's got like 20,000 bumper stickers. Now, the question is, do your eyes, are your eyes drawn to the guy with the 20 or even five bumper stickers? I would suggest that, yes, your eyes are drawn to that. So first thing is take off the blasted bumper stickers. There's all sorts of tutorials you can find on the net for how to use like WD-40 and a spatula for how to scrape off the uh, bumper stickers without harming your, uh, your, your, the paint on the car at least too much. There's all sorts yeah. of things you can do to, for a nominal cost that you can do to remove the bumper stickers uh, and, and thus gain some of your anonymity back. Yeah, yeah, and it is worth mentioning like a, like the uh, Don't Tread on Me uh, bumper stickers and the uh, Ron Paul ones. Uh, there was that uh, release from, I think it was the Department of Homeland Security, uh, mm-hmm. Signs of Extremism on the Profiling Archive. Like those are things that are mentioned. Uh, so, and, and, and I would say most, if not all, of the police departments get these memos. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, that's a pretty that's a pretty pretty simple one. Uh, so, uh, does the uh, clean, cleanliness of your car matter? If your car is dirty as hell, uh, are you gonna bring more? Are you gonna draw more attention? Well, I know that when I've been on the roads and I see somebody who's been mud bogging, my eyes get drawn to it real quick. So I'm just gonna go ahead and say yes. I would also say too that, like in the context of a traffic stop, if the officers see again, remember the plain view rule. If the officer, like, looks through the windows and he sees a lot of messy stuff, he might make some assumptions of one kind or another that you're up to no good, you bad lawbreaker of victimless crimes, you, uh, if the car is dirty. Uh, and cops do this, by the way. 
uh, you know, it's investigatory, reasonable suspicion, not quite probable cause or whatever the legal term is. Uh, so, but on the other hand, if you have, if like the back seat is actually like reasonably clean, even if it's an older car, uh, you might throw it some suspicion there. And also there's issues of like, you know, even, even if it's not the context of a traffic stop, but let's say you're in a parking lot and you're out shopping to kind of reasonably deter, at least to some degree, people who might, uh, try to, you know, use slim Jim to gain access to your car and all that, because if it looks messy, you might have something there. But then if, of course, if it's clean, Presumably, they won't see much of anything. So there's also a security issue as well. Uh, but yeah, generally speaking, you really want to try to keep the car as clean as possible. And again, that can be done for a nominal cost. You don't have to pay. You don't have to go to the automated. Uh, and this is more of a frugality uh, issue. I'll just mention it briefly here. You don't have to go to like the automated car washing uh, thingies at some gas stations. You can actually go to kind of arguably lower cost uh, self-cleaning uh, stations where you actually have to get out of the car and put the coins in the meter and they still exist. I can find them all around Austin. Oh yeah. Yeah. They're, and, yeah, they're and, all around. And, 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 you know, and preferably wear some clothes that you don't mind getting dirty in, uh, and probably sandals too. Uh, and, you know, basically just, you know, put the thing in and you get like your two minutes and you select the thingy with the wash and you go around the car and you wash it. And then once you get all the soap everywhere, you sl- sl- go with the selector thing, press the button, you got the, the, wa- the rinse cycle, and then you rinse off all the soap and everything else. I mean, it's not – and, of course, you can also uh, vacuum your car out too. So you handle the exterior and you handle the interior. And that can actually, uh, you know, depending on certain circumstances, might actually keep you out of jail because the only problem with really dirty cars besides more of the security issue is that if you are being prosecuted by the government for something um, – they might very well uh, try to see if they can make use of any DNA evidence from, like, the backseat of your car, if you know what I mean. I want to be kind of polite here, uh, and so forth, if you don't keep that, that thing clean. So, you know, I'm just saying. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So let's move forward to the next one here, uh, home hardening, uh, how to fortify your domicile against intruders. Uh, so we're talking about uh, the, the homes here. How do you defend your home from uh, – how do you – yeah, protect your home from uh, invaders. So uh, what is home hardening? Well, essentially, I guess home hardening could be simply defined as basically using multiple layers of security, uh, physical security, to prevent intruders of whether the public or private persuasion, like burglars or even police, from uh, basically causing you undue damage, uh, at least too much so. Very good, very good. So uh, something very, very important to... Um, home hardening is uh, the castle doctrine. Uh, what is that? Well, this was actually an old concept that goes as far back as 1604. It was a uh, Seaman's case in, in Britain. The short version basically is that the Attorney General of England at that time, Sir Edward Coke, uh, mentioned that, uh, <laughs> and this concept has been repeated by others like William Pitt and, and other people since then, where essentially, you know, the, you know, an Englishman's home is his castle. And so uh, if, you know, if there's like a, like a home invasion, like a burglary, and the homeowner kills the burglar, it is not murder. Because the burglars, well, they may be arguably nonviolent. I don't know if there is such a thing as a nonviolent burglar. Um, but he may, not be, uh, he may not be willing to use force. He may just be more of a cat burglar type, right, using stealth. Uh, but then again, it could also be a very more brute force type of burglar, and they may even feel a little uh, rape happy tonight too, especially if there's women folk around. So the uh, the legal protection in terms of justifiable homicide, there's a reason. You know, if, if it's like three in the morning and you hear some weird noises or uh, or, bro- or the windows breaking and all that, yeah, lethal not just force, but lethal force is absolutely on the table. And, of course, it's also further codified in the uh, Texas Penal Code specifically. Okay, very good, very good. And I haven't, I haven't looked at the Illinois uh, in regards to that. I know there's – well, actually, standard ground is different than the Castle Darkness, so just, yeah, ignore that. Uh, but uh, so, so I guess uh, we talked about what it is. Let's talk about the direct action of it. Uh, what, what are some ways uh, to, to harden your home? Well, like I said in the article, there's pretty much uh, the ex- there's pretty much the exterior and then the interior. The exterior would be things like the windows and the doors, as well as the walls. Uh, for the windows, you can pretty much use safety or security window film to pretty much just uh, to pretty much just kind of protect the windows from being shattered, or even if they are shattered, to delay 
the burglar actually going through the window, which a lot of times that might be enough time for you to either bug out or if you want to stand your ground, uh, you know, make sure you uh, get behind some cover, make sure your ankles of fire are covered and, you know, get ready to uh, get some business done as it were. Uh, either way, it, it helps you is what I'm saying because of the delay. Um, you know, prices for that range anywhere from 20 to $50 per roll, depending on what you're looking at. Some people try to invest in bulletproof glass, but then you're talking about anywhere between several hundreds, even a few thousand dollars, which most people can't really afford too easily. Uh, for doors, there's all sorts of braces that can be, uh, there's all sorts of braces that can be used and they can range in the couple hundred dollar area. Uh, different products, probably on guard is probably the best one, arguably, uh, unless people can find a, a better one to kind of brace the doors. Um, if you want to go for more of a, of a permanent option, you could try and replace uh, your, uh, your doors with maybe uh, solid core doors, which are noticeably more expensive. Although a lot of houses and apartment, apartment doors and all that will already come with solid core. So in a lot of cases, that's not even too much of an issue. Um, regarding walls, uh, the only thing I can really think of is basically constructing like a retaining wall using cinder blocks that are reinforced with rebar and concrete. I go into detail in the article about uh, pretty much some guidelines as far as like the pricing of it. And then, of course, uh, I link to some sources that go into more detail about how to more like in a more tutorial fashion, how to go about doing that. Um, and regarding the in, uh, regarding more the interior, uh, you know, people have mentioned about like safe rooms. Mm hmm. Uh, and, and so forth. Um, you know, I guess there is value to that to some degree. The, the main thing though, as far as like keeping this, like in terms of frugality, like keeping this somewhat affordable is that you pretty much want to try and convert a portion of wherever you live. You know, some people will choose a bathroom, but sometimes that's not always the best, especially if there's a window in the, uh, in the bathroom, uh, that, that could be improvised into a type of safe room, especially if you were to like, um, uh, especially if you were to like bar the door to the bathroom as well, or maybe replace the hollow core door to the bathroom with like a solid core. So you can kind of like mix and match a little bit depending on what you want to do and how much you want to spend. Um, there's also, and you know, if things really get uh, nasty, you could try using booby traps. Although some people really kind of say, well, it's, it's sometimes it may be illegal or sometimes not. And I don't know. Um, you know, people, there are all sorts of pranksters who've developed the technology in terms of, like, non-lethal booby traps, you know, just for, like, practical jokes and stuff. And a lot of times that will slow down burglars. So that's at least one option. And then, of course, probably your final layer is actually using a firearm. So I think people can kind of see that if you have these layers of security, if everything goes well and you did all your work ahead of time, you shouldn't have to kill anybody. Uh, but quite frankly, there is a reason for stand your ground laws. And that's just kind of what the article in large part was about. Okay. Good deal. Good deal. And, and you know, I, I've mentioned on the, on the, on this broadcast a number of times that, yeah, after I graduate from college, I'm going to go move down to Southern Illinois and, uh, and, uh, build my own place, whether it's a machine shed house, which is really neat. If you haven't heard of them, go just Google it. Machine shed house. Uh, yeah, really neat stuff. Uh, I don't want a tiny home, but uh, it was so, not not something big, but not something that small. Um, but uh, yeah, hearing about all this stuff, like this is going to be fun when that time comes. Uh, I'll just kind of leave it at that for now. <clears throat> but uh, so you mentioned how to do it, but why why should people even consider uh, uh, har uh, hardening their home? They should consider hardening them home because I doubt any of them want to be a, vic a crime victim. I mean, if you don't want to be mugged, if you don't want to be raped, if you don't want to be uh, beaten by thugs of any kind, then you should really consider hardening your home because it's not just being, quote unquote, out on the streets where there's a threat of, of violence. It's also them just breaking into people's homes. So even if you never leave your home, you should still consider home hardening as well because just because you're at home does not therefore mean you are immune to criminal violence. Yeah, yeah, that is uh, that is definitely true. That is definitely true. Let's uh, move forward to the next one here. Uh, probably about halfway through section three. Man, uh, interpersonal diplomacy: the value of keeping the peace. Uh, why are etiquette and diplomacy uh, important? I mean, wh why should why should people, anarchists, libertarians, care about uh, etiquette and diplomacy? Well, simply defined, I guess you could say diplomacy is the skill in dealing with others without causing bad feelings. Um, I would say the reason why libertarians should really kind of care about this is uh, 
there's a lot of talk about negotiating, right, and, and being an entrepreneur and, and so forth. Well, a lot of that actually does require a diplomatic tact. It's a little hard to grow a business if you're constantly yelling at people all the time or otherwise just being really disagreeable a lot, even if it's not necessarily in what you say but in how you say it. So if you are more diplomatic, you can actually avoid a lot of problems and, yes, retain your privacy. Because a lot of things I've noticed over the years, Shane, are where people will get into basically these pissing contests. Uh, and a lot of it stems not even so much from the truth or falsity of the subject matter or what's being disputed about, but more from the way in which the dispute is being conducted. And especially very publicly and very brazenly, which is the only reason I know about any of this stuff, uh, over the years. And so a lot of that uh, bickering can be avoided completely if people just, you know, had some sense of, of just basic etiquette. I mean, even statists insist on etiquette more often than not. Yep, indeed, indeed, indeed. Uh, so uh, let's see. Uh, so uh, what you're kind of explaining is peaceful coexistence. Um, yes. So, so, I mean, what, uh, this is probably pretty obvious, uh, but, like, what is the, the significance of that? Well, the significance, well, okay, why peaceful coexistence matters? Well, human beings are individuals. And as such, there's going to be a variety in terms of, like, personality temperaments. I don't want to get too deeply into psychology for t because of time. But the idea here, when you are being diplomatic, when you are making the effort to keep the peace, is that you're also learning how to, how shall I say, you're killing them with kindness. And this isn't just applicable to more serious situations like a, like a police interrogation, but also even when you're just dealing with people, when you are, as we'll get to shortly, um, when you are trying to like, you know, choose your allies and you're trying to like get business associates or hell, even just good old fashioned romantic dating even. You, you know, I mean, think about it. I mean, do uh, do, do does the opposite sex, uh, whichever way you're viewing this from, does the opposite sex really want to go on dates with somebody who's just a jackass? No, uh, maybe I guess some people do, but yeah, quite so a, some people, yeah, but most most no. <laughs> right, that's kind of what I'm getting at. So, regardless of specifically what you're doing, generally speaking, if you have some degree of diplomatic tact and some basic, not, I'm not talking Emily post etiquette, but you know, basic things like open doors for people even. Um, that can make life a lot smoother and also for the purposes of security culture help you retain your privacy than if you had not. Because of course, if you don't have, like I said with when we were talking about the gray man, if you don't have those social customs and you're violating cultural norms, it's like, hey, that guy's being a jerk. Well, guess what you just did? You just drew, a tra uh, you just, uh, drew attention to yourself you didn't mean to, didn't you? Well, let me play devil's advocate here because, I mean, obviously holding doors open for people or, or things of that nature, like it, it's not as common as it should be, you know. Like a lot of people say chivalry is dead, which I don't think it is. But uh, but nonetheless, like I, I, it was actually last Thursday uh, when I was going to get my my classes scheduled for higher level indoctrination. And uh, like I, I, I waited five seconds and I held the door open for somebody and I drew attention. Uh, so, I mean, I, I do think that uh, that could that even if you do follow that, it could still draw attention. But again, it's all about blending into the environment. So if the environment is uh, not holding doors, and obviously don't do that. But, but again, maybe that's not perhaps the best example. Uh, but, it, but it's also not limited to those kind of norms. It can also be related to your use of language and how you say things. So if you're in an environment, uh, let me put it this way. If you're in an academic environment, you shouldn't be acting in a manner that would be more appropriate to a mosh pit and vice versa. Well, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, that's yeah, what I'm getting yeah. at. In, well, that's what I'm getting at in terms of etiquette. In fact, I think you, uh, I think mirrored an article about like mosh pit um, behavior or something that effect yeah, the, on the alleyway site. The, the spontaneous order of, uh, of a mosh pit or something. Mm -hmm. like that. Right. And so, so there are cultural norms regarding mosh pits that mm -hmm. that are followed. So people like joshing each other around, and it doesn't violate the non-aggression principle, and so forth. And really, that's that's what the interpersonal diplomacy is kind of getting at too. Is very similar to the gray man, where if you f the, the key idea is this: if you follow social norms and and, and cultural, uh, reg, you know, regular behavior uh, that that are appropriate, 
you can retain your privacy better than if you hadn't. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay, we've got a few left. This is, this is definitely going to be our longest broadcast, and I, I feel bad for, for Mr. Producer over there. <laughs> I, I really do, but we're, we've got three broadcasts left for the Direct Action Series, and well, I, I guess two after tonight. So, like, this is this has got to get done here. Like, we've got our set-in date. Uh, so, for you live listeners that are still, still sticking around, we definitely appreciate it. I know this is kind of a doozy here, uh, information overload, but that's what the audiobook and uh, – uh, and the uh, anthology are there for, so you can go through it in your own time with uh, with with much more detail. Uh, so, uh, disingenuous uh, activists, why leaderless resistance is preferable to formal organizations. Uh, a very very good article, definitely check it out. Uh, but Kyle, I mean, <clears throat> activists are trying to like they're trying to restore freedom. They're they're trying to show that the government is violent. They're trying to show that laws are bad. Aren't all of those people good? Like, aren't all activists genuinely good people? Absolutely not. And the reason I say that is because what portion of the history has been thankfully documented, because you have to keep in mind here, we're talking about a mostly undocumented history where the information is very much compartmentalized and you have to go to the original sources of the actual people involved in many of these disputes and so forth, as I have done at least with some of them. What has been documented is absolutely atrocious and really convinces me that there is such a thing as a disingenuous activist. So somebody, you know, uses I don't like that I don't like the term activist in the first place for other reasons, which probably save it for another time, because I think it's just a synonym for reformism personally. Uh, but even if somebody wanted to use that term in the sense of like being an advocate for something, just because they claim to be that, regardless of their ideology, regardless even if they're more single issue focused, regardless of even that. If there are ulterior motives at play, they're, 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 they're disingenuous. What they're claiming is what they're claiming is not for the purposes for what they're claiming it. So, and I don't care what it is. I mean, so that article that I really just people, you know, uh, look at at their own time is really look at the different case studies I uh, write about and, and provide sources for because this is not something that's compartmentalized, the patriot movement it's not something unique even in libertarian circles. Like, this is broad. Like, this affects any notion of activism, so-called, in these United States. Like, it's really it's, – it's a recurring problem. Yeah. Yeah, it, it definitely is. It definitely is. And, and we did, did have a few examples here, uh, such as uh, Christopher Cantwell with the Free State Project, uh, Oath Keepers abandoning the Militiamen in Bundy Ranch in 2014, and uh, the Second Amendment Foundation uh, absorbing and diluting the Jews for preservation of firearms ownership. Uh, and then also uh, an openly uh, – Mark Kessler, an openly admitted government informant. Uh, data mine his own membership but for the sake of time i'm going to skip past those go check out the article please definitely definitely check it out um there's a few examples of why activism or, or why these these formal organizations are, are are very bad for just uh uh efficacy and also for uh for the, for the data mining of your privacy too uh so i, I guess I, I hate to skip past those examples but uh, i would mention no, no. one thing i do want to mention one it. thing very briefly the topic of disingenuous activists would very easily be its own two-hour broadcast because of the case studies, because the case studies themselves require some, some knowledge that takes a while to describe. So just, just for the listeners, please understand, even though you know, we're kind of moving through this quickly, the disingenuous activist is its own broad topic. And the reason why it violates security culture, why it violates your privacy, is because a lot of infighting is is usually what happens and then of course like with mark kessler uh specifically where he like handed his membership information uh the, the information about his membership to the federal government actually so all those people are now on lists whether we're talking about c3cm or other types of lists uh because of of what he did but it's also broader than that people's privacy gets violated when they when they get in these pissing matches like i said a moment ago Definitely, definitely. But yeah, de def definitely go check out uh, the, the check out that article. I wish we had more time, but uh, uh, nonetheless, uh, well, I, I, actually, the last thing I was going to mention was uh, any of the any of these th uh, any of these individual topics of security culture could be a full two hours. So uh, this is a very very daunting task we had ahead of us, and, and we're 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 close to being finished. So you are known by the company you keep. How to choose your allies wisely. So Kyle. Uh, you know, you don't need to. You don't need to vet people, right? You just don't need to. Um, no, you, you, need, you need to vet. People. <laughs> you need to vet people. I mean, come on. 
So, so why is it important? It's important because you need to know who you're associating with. And I'm not saying violate their privacy. I'm saying, you know, sit down and have coffee with them or a beer with them or dinner with them or lunch or something uh, to where you kind of have, you know, and yeah, you do trust your intuition, at least for some people. I mean, I mean, I know I do, uh, but really kind of get a feel for how people act and, and so forth and, and really get to know who you're talking about. And, you know, regarding, sorry, go back to disingenuous activists for one second. That was something that came up with the SLV Just Us group in Costilla County, Colorado. They didn't vet the fake judges. They didn't vet them. They didn't sit down and get to know them. They just trusted them on blind faith that they were good people when, in fact, that was not the case. So when Alex Ansari mentioned that, well, a large part of the problem of why this entire thing turned into a clusterfuck and why the populist resistance against the government enforcing nuisance abatement in Costilla completely got destroyed was because the homesteaders themselves did not vet the sovereign citizens coming in from outside of Costilla and promising have very all these, you know, superfluous, you know, claims of we're going to save you and fake judges and the rest of it. So that's 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 why vetting is important. Vetting prevents problems and it prevents violations of one's privacy. That's why vetting is important. Very good, very good. And just to mention a, a couple of uh, uh, political prisoners here, real briefly, and I'll just go through this, go through this myself. Um, so obviously, William Wolf and Skylar Barbeau are two political prisoners. The archives are up on the uh, LUA uh, political prisoners archive. Uh, who betrayed William Wolf? Well, it was uh, an undercover uh, uh, FBI undercover employee. Uh, I mean, there, there's more to the story, but uh, it was just a lack of vetting. It was simply a lack of vetting, and he trusted an informant. So, um, and, and there were obviously more variables involved there. But, I mean, yeah, there was there was no vetting when it came to uh, William Wolf's case and Skylar Barbeau, uh, Oliver Murphy, his best friend, his best friend set him up and was paid over thirty five hundred dollars to do so. Uh, now, I don't know how long they've been friends, uh, but. Yeah, uh, typically your best friend wouldn't uh, uh, wouldn't uh, choose thirty over choose thirty five hundred dollars over your friendship. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, both of those things were, were issues with vetting. And if uh, if there was vetting, they probably would they probably wouldn't be in prison or they wouldn't be in jail facing prison sentences. So uh, yeah, obviously just, that's and, hypothetical. But yeah, go ahead. And, and just just a further clarification regarding William Wolf, it was actually a, a confidential informant for the FBI, and his name was Ed Gray. Ed Gray was the informant who got William Wolf in trouble, and and so forth. So, but yeah, the point is that uh, <laughs> this is why you vet people. It's not just to prevent problems like what happened in Costilla. It's also to prevent the creation of political prisoners, specifically like. Uh, William Wolf and Barbeau, where you find out about the Ed Grays and the Oliver Murphys, and you prevent them from harming your people or yourself and so forth. That's why vetting is important, to prevent people from going to jail. This isn't rocket science. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So so, so I guess, uh, like, let's, let's say you, you've sat down and had a face-to-face -face meeting with somebody, or uh, you've, you, you've, you've, you've done your initial vetting, and uh, you find out that, uh, you know, this person uh, doesn't seem to be what I thought he was. Uh, under what conditions should you ostracize an individual? Well, you can, well, in the, well, with the context you just described, you could always, uh, like, kind of gradually fall out of contact, which would be the most diplomatic way of doing it, I suppose, to go back to the other thing for a moment. Um, but I would say ostracism is really best really after somebody has, has really acted in an atrocious manner. And again, mentioning that Ed Gray was the confidential informant who got William Wolf in trouble and mentioning that Oliver Murphy got Skylar Barbeau in trouble uh, because he too was a confidential informant for the FBI. That's how you ostracize people. You use their names, Ed Gray and Oliver Murphy, confidential informants for the FBI. And you humiliate and ridicule the Ed Grace and the Oliver Murphys. I hope the audience gets the point here. To mention the Ed Grace and the Oliver Murphys. That's how you ostracize these people. You use the free press and you go to the original source documents and that judicial transparency that was mentioned earlier to get the court documents, to get the proof of who these confidential informants are and humiliating them so everybody knows what they were all about. And they can't use that right to be forgotten to wipe it either. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, it's, and that and that's what's really really amazing about security culture is, um, as you were just kind of you were just kind of mentioning like four or five of the things we discussed previously. It all just kind of goes hand in fist. Like it, they all come together very 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 nicely. Harmonious um, which, utilization. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. So. Um, and, and I want to mention for, for ostr- ostracism specifically, uh, we had a libertarian roundtable. The second one, we'll have more of those, uh, especially now when we're finished the direct action series. But uh, that was on April 24, 2016. We had Cal Mullen and Nick Hazleton, a bunch, bunch of good folks on there to, to discuss uh, ostracism. So check that out. Again, April 24, 2016. You can find that uh, on TuneIn, Stitcher, iTunes, or you can just go to uh, fprnradio.com forward slash liberty under attack. And uh, you can find, uh, find that uh, archive. So the last article. We're almost there, Kyle. We're almost there. Uh, <laughs> uh, may you live in interesting times. So uh, why don't you just provide a brief overview of what that article kind of entailed, or what, what, your goal with, what your goal with it was. Sure, and obviously, much like disingenuous activists, this one too could easily be two hours, mainly because of what this uh, organization discovered about, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, some uh, kind of unscrupulous and bad people. But briefly for, for tonight... Basically, it was called the Committee of Safety Common Law Court, or COSCLC. And please, 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 for the listeners, do not get hung up on the name. What they really were was basically a patriot group that essentially was something more along the lines of like a pro bono dispute resolution organization, which is more of that kind of voluntarist idea. Of, of and, also, and also, sorry, Kyle, and also the common law court thing, do not get that confused with the bastards at the National Liberty Alliance. Do not get that confused. They're two completely different things. But go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes. And, and, obvi- and that's why I said don't get hung up with the name. We're not talking about an actual committee of safety and we're not talking about a, a so-called common law court of, of the NLA variety or anything else. Please do not get hung up with the name. That's what the Patriot Group decided to call itself for, uh, for, for better or for worse. Uh, but the point of the COS CLC, how what their actual practical function was, was more as like kind of like an anarcho-capitalist version, uh, more but without making money though. It was pro bono, but kind of like what the anarcho-capitalists want to do in terms of like privatizing the judiciary, right? They were fact finding. Uh, they kind of, uh, I guess you maybe you could say citizens grand jury, maybe, but that that's not even accurate either, uh, because they weren't they weren't going after government agents at all. They were. It was more of like a self-policing mechanism. So when you look at the different cases involving Jim Stack, Rick Light, Luke Rydkowski, and Ed Snook, uh, they were able. The COSCLC was able to discover real, provable, uh, or at least you know under prob- you know probable cause that these individuals had caused real harm. And we're talking everything from entrapment to embezzlement to fraud to, of course, uh, slander, libel, and defamation. So these are not things that should be taken lightly. And again, this easily, going through the evidence that the COSCLC has been able to discover over the years uh, about these individuals, and as well as their own functioning, uh, would easily take up two hours just to go through all, because this is very, very detail-laden. But yes, um, I mean, there is some pretty nasty stuff that went on. So hopefully... Uh, the idea behind in terms of enforcement would again be ostracism, right? So that Jim Stack and Rick Light and Luke Rudowski and Ed Snook would be ostracized from uh, the Patriot movement and from libertarian circles as well based on their very bad behavior, which of course violates the non-aggression principle without question. At least that's how, as far as I would see it anyway. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And just to mention his name again, just to make it very, very clear because I'm not a fan of this person. I know Kyle is not either and it's for good reason. We covered the Luke Rudkowski. Again, Luke Rudkowski. Luke Rudkowski, we are change. Um, yeah, Luke Rudkowski. Uh, yeah, we covered that uh, uh, in uh, Activist Legal Defense Fund scam in, uh, in April of last year. I don't remember the exact day I should have pulled it, but uh, and I think we covered Ed Snook too. Pretty sure we covered Ed Snook and maybe Rick Light as well, but I, I don't know. We, we've covered a couple well, that of Well, yeah, but that was, that was regarding the Activist Legal Defense Fund's uh, scam specifically. And yes, that was part of the – that was the major uh, thrust behind the CO, COSCLC's uh, investigation of, of Luke Rudowski was, was looking through the bank records that had been leaked and discovering all sorts of malfeasance and embezzlement that I was mentioning earlier and so forth. Uh, but yeah, there, there were more cases they did that weren't just about legal defense funds. There was other stuff. Uh, some things in one particular case mentioned briefly in passing here that kind of mimics something like a Randy Weaver type situation that could have gone exactly like Randy Weaver if, if, uh, if things had, uh, if they, if certain events happened, uh, 
thankfully a different way where, where Ruby Ridge situation was thankfully avoided. But yeah, there's been some close calls and some other very fun things. Again, topic for another time to go into more detail. But uh, yes, um, let me put it this way. Informant hunting and, of course, ostracism of such informants is uh, a rather important, genuinely activist, if you're going to use that word, a genuinely activist type uh, activity that I wish people would do uh, more often. But then again, if they're not going to be skeptical... And if they're going to go wallow in doom porn, of course they're going to not, you know, engage in informant hunting and and providing judicial transparency and so forth. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So that was the last article. Now, just a, a couple of, uh, I guess, concluding uh, questions and points. Uh, so, so I guess, how important is security culture to political or, or anti political act, anti political activism in the birdies? <laughs> well, if you want to stay out of jail. At, at bare minimum, you need to practice security culture to some degree. Um, a lot of the time when people like to do the Satagiraha, uh, you know, Gandhi type thing, which is what the guys up in Oregon did this past January where they were falling on their swords and, and really not caring about their privacy at all. Um, well, then, you know, don't be surprised when these guys go to jail, right? Um, now, those guys did it on purpose. There were other cases like Robert Beecher where he wasn't – he didn't want to tease the bear or anything like that. But because he was kind of foolish – and this is revealed in his court documents, by the way. This is why the judicial transparency is important so you know what the hell happened. Um, you know, he – there were, you know, photos uh, involving uh, – arguably incriminating uh, actions that uh, were up on fascist book, which is why you don't put incriminating photos or potentially incriminating photos up on fascist book. So yep. whether, whether we're talking intentionally or we're talking accidentally, as was the case with Beecher, you really want, if you want to stay out of jail, you got to practice some degree of security culture. Now, some people, security culture is shades of gray, just to be clear. We're not talking about Vanu like in previous broadcasts, where that is pretty much of a black and white thing for the most part, or at least arguably black and white to some degree. Security culture very much is shades of gray. You can practice a little bit of security culture. You can practice a lot of security culture. You can practice some sort of kind of wishy-washy in-between version of security culture. But you got to practice some, at least a minimal degree of security culture. And taking your right to privacy seriously if you want to stay out of prison, that, that would be kind of the first thing. Second thing is, of course, even if it's not a criminal matter, uh, even avoiding lawsuits and avoiding getting fined, like traffic uh, infractions and such. Uh, you can also save a lot of money, actually, uh, by practicing security culture. So this isn't just strictly an issue of liberty, of personal liberty. It's also an issue of making sure your wallet isn't you know, vacuumed out by the, by the court system as well, or just by unscrupulous other people who are plaintiffs in a civil case who want to use the court system to vacuum your pockets into you know, the Federal Reserve notes from your wallet into their wallets, as it were. Uh, so that's the other reason. There, there's a lot of good reasons to practice security culture. And so what's the, what's the relevance to so-called activism? Well, you can go Simon gesturing. You know, I think you had me on recently to mention about that. Mm -hmm. You can go Simon gesturing. You can, you can do various forms of culture jamming and whatever else and still practice good security culture, Simon gesturing in particular. So I think security culture has a lot of applicability to a lot of different things. Um, some examples I don't want to mention here publicly tonight, but suffice it to say, um, if you're doing things that are uh, of a somewhat riskier nature, then you could increase the probability, arguably, hypothetically, of, of getting away with it so-called um, if, if you were to be kind of, um, you know, skeptical and, and, and very pragmatic and realistic about what you can, quote unquote, get away with or not. So, but, but again, here, here's the, probably the most important thing. Even if you're not committing civil disobedience at all, and you are presumably 100%, you know, legally squeaky clean, you know, legal interstices and all of that, security culture can also help you avoid problems uh, and so forth, where people just baselessly accuse you of stuff. Well, you can avoid all of that if you are uh, being diplomatic, if you are being the gray man, if you are driving the inconspicuous car, if you are using an encrypted smartphone and blah, blah, blah. So yeah. it also helps you avoid a lot of problems, even if you do want to stick, uh, you know, squeaky clean, uh, legally speaking. Definitely, definitely. So uh, it, it's definitely it's, it's safe to say, especially considering it's uh, an entire section on the Freedom Umbrella of Direct Action, uh, security culture uh, 
uh, can definitely make, can definitely bring more freedom to your to your own life. And then also, uh, you can use it in combination with other strategies such as like agorism. Uh, you got you got to practice security culture if you're practicing agorism. That's just a given. Uh, but it can definitely be combined with a lot of uh, different strategies on the FUDA uh, in order to to bring maximum freedom in your own life right now without uh, asking for permission. So, uh, Kyle, with that said, any uh, closing thoughts for the listeners? I would just say that if you care about freedom and um, and especially privacy, you should begin learning and practicing security culture. Well, the best time would have been to do it like, you know, 20 years ago, but the next best time is to do it today. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if you care about privacy in any way, shape or form, you should not just pay lip service to privacy, but actually practice security culture, which, like I said at the beginning, is applied privacy. You know, it's been three years since Ed Snowden whistle blew. And he is still a fugitive, technically. So here's the question for the listeners. Do you want Ed Snowden's whistleblowing to be completely in vain? If you want it to be completely in vain, then just completely disregard everything I've said tonight. However, if you don't want to let his whistleblowing and those of the other NSA whistleblowers and others not be completely in vain, then the best way you can you can support that overall effort to increase privacy and to you know uphold it as a core value of freedom is not just pay lip service to it and blab about it and oh my goodness here's the latest thing the NSA did but actually practice it and this book that just came out just below the surface a guide to security culture is basically a comprehensive view of security culture what it entails and yeah, some background information and, and legal interstices and so forth, but also some very pragmatic ways to begin implementing it in your life today. And you know, having said that, thank you for having me on. Not a problem, Kyle. Not a problem. And I, I definitely apologize. Although we, we, we I, I, I kind of envisioned this, but not to, not to this extent. Uh, longest show, three hours and fifteen minutes so far. But, uh, uh, but yeah, it's a bear. This, this topic is a bear, and uh, definitely go check out his anthology and audiobook. It's available at LibertyInterattack.com. Oh, 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 oh,